Good evening, residents of Everett, Washington. I would like to call to order the Everett City Council meeting of December 6, 2023. The City Council meets all requirements of the State of Washington Open Public Meetings Act. Community members are welcome to join either in person, remote, on Zoom, or by calling in. For those who wish to participate in the future on Zoom, you'll find the instructions to register for public comment on the City of Everett website under the City Council Department. Please note we do not allow comments on any kind of campaigning, whether for or against ballot measures or candidates running for office. We also do not accept comments focused on personal matters that are unrelated to city business. Clerk, will you please call the roll this evening? Mayor Franklin? Here. Vice President Tui? Here. Councilmember Ryan? Here. Councilmember Vogley? Here. Councilmember Schwab? Here. Councilmember Fossey? Here. Councilmember Jarlingo? Here. President Stonecipher? Here. And I'd like to ask Councilmember Schwab, would you please lead us in the flag salute? Be honored. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And Councilmember Vogley, would you please read the land acknowledgement? Yes, thank you. The City Council wishes to acknowledge the original inhabitants of this place, the Shtohoksh people and their successors, the Tulalip tribes. Since time immemorial, they have hunted, fished, gathered on, and taken care of these lands and waters. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and honor their sacred spiritual connection with the land and water. We will strive to be honest about our past mistakes and bring about a future that includes their people, stories, and voices to form a more just and equitable society. Thank you. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of the November 29th meeting? Councilor Ryan, so moves. Seconded. Thank you. We have a motion and a second for minutes approval. Uh, Clerk, will you please call the roll? Vice President Tui. Abstain. Councilmember Ryan. Yes. Councilmember Vogley. Yes. Councilmember Schwab. Yes. Councilmember Fossey. Yes. Councilmember Zarlingo. Yes. President Stonecipher. Yes. Good evening, Mayor Franklin. Uh, good evening, President Stonecipher, council members, and community. I have uh, a few comments this evening, uh, starting with uh, boards and commissions appointments. And I'd like to ask if I should read them all at once, because I have a large number of names, or if you want to hear each group separately. All at once would be great. Fantastic. That helps. Um, so uh, I would like to ask for your concurrence on the following appointments. For the Animal Shelter Advisory Board, Sarah Hartwell. Uh, Jennifer St. Mary, Jennifer Ward, Tegan Hampton. For the Civil Service Commission, Joe Metzger-Levine. For the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee, Quinn Davidi, Gail Gebo, Tia Winch. For the Public Facilities District, Michael Swanson. And to the Library Board, Brian Hennessy. Do I hear a motion? So moved on all the nominations. Thank you. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second for quite a slate of nominees. Uh, is there any quest are there any questions or comments? Thank them for their volunteering for service. It's really important for the city. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Clerk, will you please call the roll? Vice President Tui? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? Yes. Councilmember Vogley? Yes. Councilmember Schwab? Yes. Councilmember Fossey? Yes. Councilmember Zarlingo? Yes. President Stonecipher? Yes. Thank and you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I have more. Please continue. Got, I know you've got more. You're not done with me yet. I'm really sorry. Uh, next, you know, we have our budget uh, tonight uh, as one of our items, and I want to talk briefly about our need for revenue uh, as a city. I've mentioned this uh, for many years, and certainly we've talked about it the past few months. As we uh, move into this third and final reading towards council action, um, we clearly need uh, solutions long term to address our structural deficit and a revenue option that will help us balance our budget long into the future. And it continues to weigh heavily on my mind and I know it weighs on all of yours as well as our council. And so in January, I've asked our finance team to brief the council on potential revenue options and look forward to working with you all on this high priority. We will kind of prepare all different uh, array of options for our rich discussion early, early next year, and um, hopefully we come to uh, some recommendations in the first quarter. Next, I'd like to share a quick update on the Project Labor Agreement Ordinance. That's a good group for that tonight. Uh, we're con uh, continuing to connect with members of our unions and our community on the PLA. We've actively been uh, working on uh, 
a few new relationships that with folks that have reached out with concerns or questions or recommendations for us and we are continuing the work in 2024 Jennifer uh, has updated our current so Jennifer Gregerson, our current apprenticeship ordinance uh, and keep us moving forward and we'll be meeting with Council Member Schwab and TUI hopefully on Friday this week. Uh, so look forward to having uh, a recommendation to move forward uh, very soon. Next, I'm excited to announce an important appointment. Dan Templeman has accepted the position as Senior Executive Director in my administration. It's an important role, uh, and I'm thrilled to have him joining our team in this new capacity. Uh, obviously, we're all very familiar with Dan. He was a member of our police department for over 30 years, spending his last nine as our previous chief of police. And he gained extensive experience in law enforcement, uh, government administration, labor relations, intergovernmental relations, community engagement, and advocacy in that role. And above all, I think his relationships in the community uh, uh, have are really preparing him for this role and especially when you think about our priorities right now as as we're facing uh, fentanyl and meth crisis and crime in our city I think that his uh, expertise is going to be essential on my team so a big thank you to Dan Templeman for uh, quickly leaving retirement and agreeing to join uh, me and my team and we definitely look forward to working with him and he's gonna start Monday so very excited about that. And then lastly, I'd like to invite Chief DeRoos forward to talk a little bit about gun violence. I know uh, I've been very concerned about this. Our council is, and we have community members. Uh, obviously, many of them might be here tonight. Uh, I was recently, as I shared, for those of you that weren't here, woken up at 2.30 in the morning by the gunshots at Jackson Park. And I know uh, Chief DeRoos would like to report out on what we're doing and next steps. Yeah, it's a deep subject, and uh, thanks uh, mayor and council for having me speak for a few minutes. I know there's a lot of people here to talk tonight, so I'll be brief, but it's important enough that we have a discussion about it. Um, as you know, we had a homicide, mayor mentioned, a week ago Sunday. Um, violent crime and violent gun crime are the things that are really important to me as a, as a chief, and our response to that is also really important. Uh, a few things that we're doing just on the patrol level. Uh, we've been instituting what we're calling AEP patrols. It's not unique to this incident, but what they are, area emphasis patrols. Uh, we redeploy officers. We actually add calls to our screens, so officers will go into, in this case, Jackson Park more often during their shifts and pay attention to what's going on there. It's not that they didn't pay attention before, but this tool allows our officers to get nudged in that direction and provide extra patrols when maybe they would go to another area to uh, do those patrols. We're also, in addition, those are on-duty officers, by the way. <clears throat> in addition to that, we have overtime patrols. We call them need patrols, North, emphasis, em, North Everett Emphasis Details. Um, those patrols are on overtime, and that allows us to put officers in areas like Jackson Park um, without having to respond to calls for service. So while our patrol guys will do AEP patrols, uh, the people that are working these overtime patrols can spe spend extra time in Jackson Park. Uh, a few other things that I think are worth mentioning, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we uh, as a department, me as an administrator, I've been uh, associated and involved with, with organizations like um, the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. Myself and Councilmember Ryan attended a recent uh, seminar, I guess you would call it. Uh, basically, it's an organization that <clears throat> works to eliminate the damage caused by gun violence uh, in our communities through advocacy, education, and partnerships. Um, also, we are, and, and the mayor mentioned this last week, <coughs> involved in the Project Safe Neighborhoods program. This is a Department of Justice program that uh, brings together people from all levels of the government uh, to develop comprehensive data-driven approaches to fight violent crime. Now, it's a great partnership to have. I get to go next week to a conference in Indianapolis where I get to basically be in a room with administrators from agencies of similar size to Everett and hopefully share what's working well for them in their communities when it comes to addressing violent crime. Um, the second to last thing I'll mention is uh, Chief Templeman, before he retired, applied for and we received uh, through the Bureau of Justice Assistance National Training and Technical Assistance Center, a I don't know exactly what you'd call it. It's basically a program that they've designed where they contract with 
subject matter experts on violent crime. They bring him in to the city that it gets this award, uh, in this case, Everett. Uh, we were selected from a group of agencies. There were many that weren't selected. And these subject matter experts do a top to bottom assessment of the way we do business in our community and the unique factors that play into how we do that work in Everett. And then after that two day on site, they provide a, I think they call it a strategic plan that on how we should address violent crime. And so we basically open our doors to this organization to come in and use their expertise to tell us what we can do better. So I'm looking forward to <clears throat> for that to happen. They are in the contract stage now, and so we anticipate sometime in the near future they will be doing their on-site. And I'll, and I'll end with this. Um, since this homicide occurred uh, at Jackson Park, I've been meeting with parks, I've been meeting with public works, I've been meeting with other city departments. Uh, we recognize this as a whole city issue and we're all putting our heads together. There's still more to come, still more discussions that I'm sure you'll hear from some people today that have some ideas on how we should address this challenge in that section of our city. But um, I just wanted to share with council and the people here tonight that it's something that we're actively working on and there's more to come on, on what that plan looks like. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chief. Any other questions? Council Member Ryan. Thank you. For the uh, study that you mentioned, Chief DeRoos, the, um, how is that different from the matrix study that was recently completed? Which, which one are you talking about? I'm sorry. Uh, your last point, you had there was a group that was going to be coming in to look at yeah. the practices and provide suggestions. The Bureau of Justice Assistance, a federal agency, and we had to apply for this program. Uh, they are the ones, the Bureau of Justice Assistance and their Training and Technical Assistance Center, they um, go out and seek the subject matter experts that are specifically focused on violent crime. The matrix study was a top to bottom assessment across the entire department um, to look at efficiencies and you know, how we manage everything, not just our focus on violent crime. So these are experts in that field that are gonna come and say, you should consider doing this, or maybe you should change the way you respond to that. Thanks, and I'm glad to hear too that there's a collaboration with parks and facilities. So the neighborhood's been asking for quite a while for gates and better lighting, which I think could probably be used for many of our parks across the city, especially with the better lighting and other SEPTED <coughs> types of um, approaches to, to crime. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Chief. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Chief DeRoos. Uh, with that, I have no further comments, but yeah, to the to the point on, on our, our work, we are evaluating lighting systems. Uh, I can tell you that fencing across all our parks is something that is has a lot of pros and cons. Uh, it does not resolve all the crime that we see, and we kind of have to assess what type of a park environment we want to to welcome the community into. But lighting and other are, 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 are options that we are definitely looking into, and it's a it's going to be a, an expense for sure, mm -hmm. and it'll be a cross departmental collaboration, and we'll bring those recommendations most likely to a quality of life committee um, in the near uh, future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this brings us to our public comment time. Angie, do we have anyone signed up to speak this evening? Good evening, President Stone Cipher. We do. Uh, we have a few general and then some that wish to wait till item 18. But I also received uh, written comments, so I'm going to read those names that of people who submitted written comment. Um, the following are regarding riverfront development David Barron, Aaron Knight, Parker Burns, Steve Yang, Tanya Major, Mary Cunningham. Um, Randy Pospicle wrote about, um, submitted a written comment on item 20 and weights. And then the following are all in regards to item 18. Martin Adams, Alex Schesser, Daniel Murphy, Sydney Gillis, Angela DeFilippo, Shelley Whitcop, Michael Schreck, Lisa Phillips, Stephanie West, Holly James, and Anita. And that's it for written comments. Thank you. And for those that are in the chambers, I just want to remind you that uh, if you're speaking here, uh, you have a three minute limit. I'm going to be very strict on it because we've got a, a broad agenda tonight. And also want to remind you that, that no clapping or other displays of um, support, if you would like to silently uh, wave your hand and support, you may do that. But please, um, no disruptions of our proceedings. So first, um, if Matt could please come to the podium, followed by John Trainer, 
and that's Matt Fraser. And if you could please state your full name and city of residence. Absolutely. Uh, you guys have seen me in the last few meetings already anyway, so you're like, oh, God, this guy's talking again. So uh, real quick, Matt Frazier, South Everett. Um, I just wanted to make a couple comments. Uh, you approved the Aquasock stuff last time. I, I know that there's a, a lot of good that comes with that. And I'm just hoping that I start seeing some good with uh, sidewalks and some good with uh, maybe making people slow down so I don't feel like I'm going to get ran over when I'm walking, you know, and around our school districts and stuff so we, we can see see some of that development, not only go to the Aquasox, but go to the people that work every day and live here. So um, ultimately though, I'm here about animal control. So the up upcoming animal control changes, I just encourage you, if you haven't reviewed it, please review it quickly because it needs to be passed because I think that stuff's getting ready to sunset pretty soon and uh, some of the stuff that's in here is really, really, really good. So everybody knows. They're not coming after your roosters. They're just trying to get full-size livestock out of Everett. So, uh, but other than that, thank you guys for listening to me. I appreciate it. So have a good day. Thank you. John, if you could please come to the podium, followed by Scott Sparling. Please state your full name and city of residence. Thank you. John Trainer, uh, Everett District 2. Um, well, when we vote, uh, the hope is that we have vetted our candidates and that we've chosen wisely and educate ourselves on who we want to be in positions. And sometimes the people you want to win don't win, and sometimes they do. But ultimately, that should be up to the voters, who stands for office and who doesn't. Um, you know, last week, there were some comments made on, by council members on, at the dais here about the nonpartisan nature of your work. You all do a pretty good job of being nonpartisan Every one of you do. There's no conflict with your regular job, whatever that is. If the city as a council wants to address the part-time position and limit what the other job can be, then perhaps if you're not willing to pay it full-time, then you should stay out of the other business. It's up to the voters to decide who they want on council. And I really think y'all could focus on some other things than this. Found four syringes in my yard today. You got a stadium you want to build? There's a homicide. Get to work. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. If you can come to the podium. Followed by Michelle Pendergrass. Please state your full name and city of residence. Uh, my name is Scott Sparling. Uh, city of Everett, 98201. Uh, I just wanted to. I just caught wind of this, this um, ordinance being floated or proposed, limiting, uh, limiting how many positions a council member can hold, and I just wanted to express opposition to that. Uh, I feel like it's something that probably should be put to a vote, maybe, if, if addressed at all, uh, just as our representatives and council members are voted for. Uh, I mean, if somebody earns 57% uh, of a vote in two jurisdictions, clearly the majority of voters value, trust, and deserve to have such a person be their voice at whatever positions they're elected to. Uh, and there are even two nearby examples of council members who serve at both the state and local level simultaneously, Strom Peterson and Sam Lowe, one of whom is county council, a full-time position in itself, but I'm sure you all know this already. Just wanted to express uh, uh, my opinion about what I know about the ordinance and how undemocratic it feels. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And then followed by Emily Simpson. My name is Michelle Pendergrass. I live um, here in Everett, um, Rockefeller and 23rd. I um, voted for Mary Fossey twice, knowing that I voted for her twice for two different positions. And it's because I really liked her. And if um, her position as city council doesn't seem to be um, underneath the job as a representative in any way, shape, or form. And so I say, you know, these sorts of people who are awesome should be allowed to be awesome. And I'll just keep it simple. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Please come to the podium and followed by Isabella Valencia. Okay. 
Hello, Emily Simpson. I live in the Waits Motel. Uh, good evening. Uh, the best thing to happen recently was a book fair that I had at the motel. It was pretty packed, really fun. And um, we started talking about some of the bitter truths. And um, this motel has immersed me into an environment of true diversity, young, old, variety of backgrounds, heritage, low income, and even exposure to higher income people on occasions. When it comes to the rhetoric about your position of inclusion and diversity, the general consensus among the common people here was um, it's performative. So blight, meaning what? To be eliminated? I mean, I'm just happy that it's not a genocide. So when it comes to Common Street, um, I'll send you guys a detailed email. Um, I'm sure they're trying the best that they can, so, so are you guys, but it's a really tall order to relocate or displace these people. It includes three Native, three Native Americans, five elderly, five blue collar workers, two children under five, one injured, and one with severe mental health issues. So we have all accepted assistance, and um, we all want to touch that grass that's greener that we've been promised. Um, with this power grab for property, you took repairing um, the major and minor things off the table for Doug and I and investors. I can live with that. Um, one of the other many bitter truths is that I've thought about long and hard is that my mistake was being honest, open, and transparent. Um, it is often a political strategy to take credit for another's effectiveness. The results in regards to the crime issues are because of me and the help of the community hard at work. We got our hands dirty. We didn't just pose with a golden shovel. I was guided and trained by the company I helped start, CAPN, Community Assisted Protection Network. I'll never forget how hard it was turning things around. Of course, the equity of the property went up and the condemnation use of eminent domain went into motion after 30 years of not listening to people. So, by not investing in social workers, caregiver, healthy systems, everything we needed to survive independently was blocked. Label yourselves protectors and providers um, and hold human rights over our heads. It's been really stressful living there, not having a sense of security for how we're going to live. And it is hurting a small business, tribe and true. That's where we store all of our parts. The owner was generous enough to give us an entire unit for all the parts that we have coming in. So that was going to happen with our business. Um, I'm sure, just like Common Street, again, you guys are doing the best you can. So are they. I will send an email with an update. And I don't know if you're allowed, but I brought some uh, get like a memento or if you'd take them you can throw them in the trash if you want but yeah thank you thank you Isabella followed by Marilyn Rosenberg <laughs> please state your full name and Hello. city of residence um, my name is Isabella Valencia and I live and work in downtown Everett district 2 and I am here on the um, Proposed action item number 18. I do not see the conflict of interest in Mary having two jobs. I see it as an opportunity for the city of Everett to have her in Olympia helping us here. We need all the help we can get. And to me, this is really um, kind of not very important. I don't understand why this item is even on here when everybody has a part-time job, everybody here has another job. Also, there are so many more important things that are happening in Everett that need our attention. This, and I could bring them up, parking, oh, I could go off on it, but I'm not going to. I'm just gonna say tonight, that's why I'm here. Please keep Mary Fossey right here where we need her. Thank you, next. No clapping, please. Charles. Or sorry, Marilyn. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yep, you're fine. Sorry. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. State your full name and city okay. residence. I'm Marilyn Rosenberg. I'm a resident here in Everett, District One. Um, my concerns also is um, with um, number 18 and deciding that people should not have a second position that is um, a city or government because um, I do not see how. It's a benefit. I was looking at the manual for new um, city council members, for new mayors. It says building connections with your state representatives. This is an excellent opportunity for us to have that bond there that we need. We should be using Mary's resources and everyone else's resources on city council and putting them on the committees that they're best suited for. I don't even see that always happening here. I. Uh, I, 
I, I think this is just ridiculous. And this is a part-time position, city council. State representative is a part-time position. There's other people here that have this position part-time and have a full-time job and have missed more meetings. You know, if you're saying that Mary or somebody's missed meetings, other people miss more. Even Brenda, you've missed the most this year. I, I just don't understand it. That's what I was looking at, it was 11 meetings. And um, Mr. Levin meetings this year. I also feel that um, you should be able to call in remote at least a certain amount of meetings. If someone needs to, they should be remote. If they're going to, it's an excellent way to be present. We have other people tuning in to them remotely, and I would, I think there needs to be that opportunity there. Um, and another um, thing I was comparing it to, Snohomish County representative, that's a full-time position. There's two people serving, and someone else brought it up too, that are in Snohomish County, and they're also state representatives, and there's no issue with that. Why are we doing this? It doesn't make any sense to me. My other really big concern is um, the neighborhoods. I think um, with so many people moving to Everett these days, especially the younger people, and I see so many posts on Nextdoor apps and everything about their concerns, why don't we get some sort of flyers or something on these apps to get them connected to their neighborhoods and get more information out there? So I think too much time is being wasted when we have other things to do. Thank you. Charles Atkins, if you could please come to the podium, followed by Ann Landis. Uh, hello, Council President Stone Cipher, Mayor Franklin, and distinguished members of the City Council. My name is Charles Atkins. I live in North Everett in Council Member Fossey's district. I'm speaking in opposition to the proposed change in policy that would ban Everett City Council members from holding multiple offices. I believe that constituents should have full say in who they choose to represent them. This measure will not serve voters, but rather take away voter autonomy and place unnecessary limitations on our right to decide who represents us on the city level. I urge the council to vote against the proposal prohibiting council members from holding other, other elected offices, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Anne, if you could come to the podium, followed by Steve Oss. Please state your full name and city residence. My name is Annie Landis. I live in North Everett. Um, I would like to share my disagreement with the proposed ordinance. As a voter, I should be able to choose who represents me based off their merits and whether I agree with their platform or values. If I vote for someone to represent me in two roles, then that is my right to do so. And when voters elect someone to two positions, they're doing so because they believe in that candidate and they know they will fight for their constituents. Councilmember Fossey is a great example of this. She is very popular with voters because she works hard, she has great policies, and she does a fantastic job advocating for the community. I voted for her to represent me as state representative, knowing she would fill both roles, and I don't see a problem with that. I am very satisfied with her work, and I would vote for her again in a heartbeat. If there were concerns that someone was not able to do both jobs with the competency and passion and dedication that Council Member Fossey has, then that is for voters to decide on the ballot, not for this body to. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, could you please come to the podium? Followed by Sonia Bodge. Good evening, Mayor Franklin, President Stone Cipher, and Council members. Thank you for this time. Uh, citizens of Everett, once a year we have a special time come forward in front of us. It's been well known as Christmas. It's right around the corner. For decades, we have done something that we call stuff a bus. And we take a bus and we fill it up with food, toys, and clothes for people in our community who are less fortunate. We start the weekend after Thanksgiving and we go for three weekends. And well, the third weekend is coming up. So far, I haven't had the privilege of seeing any of you show up yet. And I don't know if maybe I just missed 
Uh, I've been out there and I've been in and out. Um, I want to make sure that uh, you are invited, that you know that you're invited. Um, I reach out and I appreciate your participation in Everett. I know you, Everett means a lot to all of you because of what you do. Um, to the other citizens of Everett, uh, we'll be at Fred Meyer out at 130, uh, 130th, 19th Avenue. Uh, we'll be there from 10 o'clock in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon this weekend and next weekend. Um, it's an opportunity to help people in our community who are less fortunate than many of us here. This has affected me an awful lot. Several years ago, we had a networking with a daycare center of underprivileged kids. And when you see the look on the kids' faces when they open up a present, when you see the parents in the back, the look on their faces when they see their kids getting presents that they can't afford to give them. And the kids are going, I got something. I can talk to my friends at school when I go back after Christmas vacation. And I can tell them about the neat toy that I got. And it wasn't a number two yellow pencil. That might sound a little odd, but that's about all some of the kids get. Nothing more than a pencil, maybe some crayons. This is an opportunity for us to give when we have plenty. We can give with our time, we can give uh, with our resources. And I ask you all to come out and participate in any way that you can. And I thank all of you for this time. President Stonecipher, yes. um, first, uh, thank you, Steve, and the entire transit department. It's actually on my calendar for Saturday, so you'll see me there Saturday. But I just want to do a big shout out. They've done this every year. We also have a number of other departments that are uh, running multiple giving programs. There's a giving box in our in uh, the basement of uh, EMB or the, the ground floor of EMB. Our police department does shop with a cop. Our fire department is doing uh, toy drives. So I really appreciate how all of our public servants are really stepping up to to serve the community and thank you for hosting this event once again this year. Thank you. It's my my privilege. Thank you. Next, Sonia, if you could please come to the podium, followed by Ryan Weber, and please state your full name, city of residence, and you have three minutes. I am Sonia Bodge, Delta Neighborhood um, Everett. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like we've been here a, a year ago when shootings started at Jackson Park. Um, and we came then asking for your help to try and make Jackson Park a little more secure like some of the other parks in the city. Um, I went around to, I don't know, six or seven parks at that time to check out the gate situation at these other places. And um, I spent, I and a couple other neighbors here spent, spent years now calling in to the rangers, to the park enforcement, to the police about the parking situation and RVs in the upper park parking lot, the lower parking lot, the garden lot, we call it the garden lot. And um, that's where p people uh, would congregate to do things they shouldn't be doing or be staying there <coughs> after hours. And we asked you then to help us maybe secure those areas, uh, which would free up the police from having to expend overtime payroll on something like that, or having the rangers come late. Um, but we got bubkis, and um, it just seems like you're not listening to us. You know, I, uh, I, want, I don't want to say we're being terrorized, but, you know, my car's been paintballed. Some lady posted on next door a couple weeks ago, her, her husband's truck was spray painted, and the kids joyrided around in the car all day, terrorizing our neighborhood a week or two ago. Um, the Saturday morning of the shooting, I got up at 9 or 8, and thought, well, I'll go down to uh, uh, the alley where all, a lot more graffiti is. I and another neighbor have cleaned up graffiti ourselves with our own paint uh, in the park. And I thought, I'll go down the alley. And I got four properties that morning to turn in. And when I got home that morning, I turned them into code enforcement and said, they're, they're advertising drug deals. You know, who, who are they? I don't know, you know. Sometimes I'm tongue in cheek. 
Um, and literally that night uh, happened that, that young man was uh, horribly killed. And um, I just feel like you're not paying attention to us. And what I would say is there's, a, there's an item tonight, Loganberry Trails Improvements. Uh, you've got $150,000 that you might uh, use to design and construction costs, to, to provide funding for design and construction costs of the Loganberry Trails Improvement Project because of excessive social trail making. We've, we have people dying at our park. So I'm hoping that you can find, carve some money out for our park finally to get some better lighting, some speed humps on that alley so that it's not an easy drive by, you know, place. Um, and the gates on at least the two larger parking lots to free up resources. And, you know, I, I don't think it's my job to constantly police that area. I'd like parks department to go through there more often and paint things. Um, anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Please come to the podium, followed by Janine DeMarcus. And please state your full name and city residence. Hi, Ryan Weber, uh, District 1, Delta Neighborhood. Um, yeah, this is a sensitive subject. Um, I and others in the Delta Neighborhood approach you today dealing with a range of emotions following another teen gunned down at Jackson Park. Um, grief at the loss of a youth at their prime, disbelief that it could happen where we live and play, anger to those who invade our, on our feelings of safety, and fear that it will happen again. Even fear to speak up about it happening. Uh, there are multiple areas of action that I believe should be taken uh, to address the violence. Um, there's not a single solution that's going to fix everything, and we all know that. So uh, please be respectful of that. Uh, I don't have the answer to everything. <laughs> um, structural improvements of the park, police reforms, youth services. A few improvements to the built environment would make it harder to conduct drug deals in the dark in the parking lot after the park is closed. I drove by there on the way here and reported two vehicles in the dark. I can't tell make, model, even color because the parking lots are so dark. They're not supposed to be there and who knows what they're doing. Um, we need uh, more lighting to include the picnic shelters, gates around the, for the parking lots. Not, I, I don't want to see a fence all the way around the park. I know Silver Lake has one, but um, what else? Uh, speed humps. You'd have to change some of the traffic codes to allow speed bumps again, or speed humps, what have you. But I think that would really help make it difficult to drive around shooting at our youth in the middle of the night, or daytime, which is what happened a year and a half ago. Um, we have a gaping hole in Delta for youth services. This has been known for decades. Um, our teens have nowhere to go, nothing to do in the neighborhood. We need a teen center, a library branch as safe spaces to access mentorships, learning, a place to get out of the rain, a place to stay out of trouble. Uh, I'd like to see those as requirements to the Park District uh, PDO. We know that parks are understaffed due to budget cuts, but I believe that gates do not significantly impact staffing needs since the park staff already locks and unlocks two bathroom facilities at dawn and dusk at this park. This would add five minutes or less, I would say, just to close and open a gate. Um, there are times when an expense cannot be spared, and after two teens have been victim, I believe this is one of those times. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Please come to the podium and state your full name and city residence. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. My name is Janine Demeray. I reside in Everett at Crown Drive. I am here tonight to address the upcoming ordinance trying to restrict a city council member, a part-time position, from holding dual offices. As I am sure many of you are aware, the Washington State AG opinion clearly states that a city council member that also holds a position in the state legislature is not considered to be holding incompatible offices. 
There have been multiple instances of both sides of the political aisle holding dual offices in Washington State on record. This is not a new occurrence that is happening with Councilmember Fossey. Council President Stonecipher presented some concerns supported by Council Members Arlingo to what she is requesting this ordinance. <clears throat> One is the concern over the fear of partisanship influencing council members decision making process and what is supposed to be a nonpartisan position. On August 2nd of 2023, a quote in the Everett Herald from incoming and returning council member Scott Bader stated that the council was tipping more liberal, which is in part reason for his run. Is that not a partisan stance? Do you think that his working for the Archdiocese for a large portion of his career won't influence his decisions around the contentious and vital issue of reproductive rights? City councils across this country have made their cities sanctuary cities for the unborn. I bet I could guess how Mr. Bader would vote. Scott Bader aligns with an institution that sends its parishioners warning letters if they publicly advocate for abortion rights and access, or anything that doesn't align with church doctrine. Are abortion rights not a partisan issue? If partisanship is the actual issue here, then you would think that allowing a PCO, someone who aligns with a specific political party, would also be prohibited and not allowed per section one of this ordinance proposal? Whether or not is it, a, it is a paid position is irrelevant. The fear of partisanship influencing council is supposed to be the issue, correct? Council President Stonecipher also stated that several members of the community have reached out to her with concerns. Shouldn't the barometer of these concerned citizens be measured at the ballot box? Shouldn't we not let council member Fossey's constituents decide whether or not she, she, she should be continuing her duties in representing them? Council President Stonecipher also cited that this position is demanding. I can imagine that to be true, and I was happy to learn that council member Fossey was able to attend more council meetings than council president Stonecipher has over the last two years. She is clearly committed to her positions even when faced with difficulty. Council member Fossey has persevered despite the challenges that life has presented to her, something that many of her constituents can align with. It seems that council member Fossey is the ideal example of leaning in, especially now as her own council members themselves are creating a divisive issue within a community that has greater and far more important struggles to spend the taxpayer time and money on. I hope the taxpayers ask themselves, who will this benefit in the long run? Who stands to gain power? It seems that this decision was not born out of community outrage, facts, or necessity, but instead political strategy. As frustrating as it is, partisanship is now in every facet of our government, regardless of whether or not it's supposed to be. It is a telling lack of imagination or awareness to think otherwise. Thank you. Gentlemen? Yeah, yeah um, one second. Karina Burns, if you could please come to the podium. State your full name and city of residence, please. My name is Karina Burns. I, I live at h and I'm a member of the Delta Neighborhood Association, and I live in the Delta neighborhood. I work for Lowe's Home Improvement in downtown. I had no idea that um, Mary holding two offices was going to be on the agenda tonight, and I just want to state that I think it's a waste of everyone's time, energy, and effort, and uh, just more indication of the fact that council has been focused in entirely the wrong direction for entirely too long. I stood before you a year ago and asked that rights be given back to our officers to help keep us safe. In that time, not much has changed in the ways of the laws regarding around what officers can do. I stand before you today and ask what people it is that you serve. We are the people that live and work in Everett and we are angry. We are tired of being let down we are by the systems put in place to protect us. I know that Sonia and Ryan have advocated for months if not years on solutions as to how to keep our park safe just to be entirely ignored. When the company that I work for has to pay out of pocket for a hazmat crew to come out and clean homeless encampment garbage and hypodermic waste every month, that's a problem. When private businesses and properties are fined or just plain unable to utilize 911 unless an immediate threat of violence is prevalent, that's a problem. When response times vary from immediate to up to an hour, that is a problem. Gang activity at schools in Everett is at a high and we are left to feel helpless in its wrath. 
I don't want to hear about the Guns for Gift Cards program because that is literally the only program I've heard of that's been put in place to get guns off the streets. And I would love to know exactly how many weapons that were turned in were unregistered or had their identifying marks removed. No progress has been made in making health care or treatment services more accessible or acquirable. Most people would rather go without help because of the nightmare involved in attempting to gain access to things like housing, mental health, and addiction services. I do not speak for only myself when I say we are tired of being showboated, tired of the generic regurgitated responses, tired of being ignored, and tired of our children being gunned down in the park. So again, I ask you what people it is that you serve because the honest, hardworking citizens do not feel like it is us. Jennifer Gordon, please come to the podium. And please state your full name and city of residence. You have three minutes to speak. Good evening, council members. Um, for the record, my name is Jennifer Gordon. I live in Everett. I'm a resident of District 1. I'm here to dis uh, voice my disappointment in Council Member Stone Cipher's proposal to bar council members from holding other elected offices. My reasons are as follows. Number one, I voted for Mary Fossey in both the city council election and the state representative race. This proposal limits the power of my vote as a constituent here in Everett. I voted for her based on her policy platform, not her political party. Um, and if this body truly acted in a nonpartisan manner, you should be able to work constructively with Council Member Fossey on the issues, not derail the Council's focus with fear mongering over some perceived politicization that has never been borne out in your agendas and work over the past few years. Um, number two, having a full time city council member work in a part time capacity for two to three months of the year yields far greater benefits than the middle, minimal loss of meeting time. It gives the member of our council personal briefings by state agencies on their structures, purposes, and budgets, including potentially funds they have earmarked for municipalities for a wealth of different policy projects. It enhances Everett's ability to conduct intergovernmental work and decreases the need for background research on state agencies, thereby improving the efficiency of this elected body. Number three, this, pro pro this proposal presents a slippery slope. Where do you draw the line? Should council members be barred from working for local nonprofits, as they are sure to have a large stake in matters that come before the council from time to time? If absence is the issue, how are you accounting for all cause absences among uh, council members? Surely you're not treating some absences as different from others. Is the threat of absence enough to bar a would-be public servant? Maybe parents of young ch children should be included. Surely they will miss many meetings due to sick kids or lack of childcare. As a constituent of this city, I do not have faith in you to set the carve outs perfectly all the time. And therefore, I don't believe the city sh council should be in the business of limiting di direct democracy in this way. To conclude, I feel this proposal is damaging to the work of our city council and to the trust of your constituents who made thoughtful votes to elect our city council members and state representatives in our own best interests. I urge you to reject this proposal and move on with the real work before you. It's a long list. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, did you want to come now instead of yes. waiting? OK. Please state your full name and city of residence. Uh, yes, my name is Terry Ambergy. I live in the Delta Neighborhood District 1. Uh, first of all, thank you for all the people before me that have spoken on behalf of um, Mary Fossey. Um, that's what I'm here to comment on. Uh, the only council member that will be affected by your vote is Mary Fossey. <clears throat> I'd like to remind you that Mary Fossey was elected to serve our voice on the Everett City Council that you could be forcing her to forfeit. Having a council member who was also elected to be our Washington State Representative is a huge asset, especially one who works as hard as Mary does on our behalf. Prior to your vote, I'd like you to reflect on your integrity and your intent. This ordinance is not about picking up the slack. Mary has commuted from Olympia and back every Wednesday to be here in person on our behalf. Integrity intention. Will it be your vote that forces our voice to forfeit her position because she no longer meets your requirements? 
I am proud to have Mary Fossey on the Everett City Council where our voices are heard and not just yours. Put your focus on affordable housing, homelessness, and crime. Intention, integrity. Thank you for your time. Thank you. If Billy Wallace could please come to the podium. And please state your full name and city of residence. Yes, Billy Wallace, uh, Lake Stevens. I'm your neighbor. But I've been asked to come here uh, by our local 292 here in Everett, proud member. And I am the political and legislative director for the district council, Washington and Northern Idaho. I represent almost 14,000 members. And I'm going to tell you, Mary Fossey is always prepared. She is ready to go. If I need to ask her a question, she's there, and that goes both ways. If she has a question about labor or whatever, transportation, whatever we're working on, you need to understand that each one of you know what it takes to be a public servant. And for her to drive up here every Wednesday night, I respect that. I drive down, and we're both looking forward to a 60-day session. The 105 is not fun. I drive home every night so I can be with my family. You need to understand the sacrifice that she does, but she puts in the time. She busts her tail off and gets things done. You should cherish the opportunity that you have her as a state rep. This only makes her a greater asset to this city. It can be done. Like you said, Sam Lowe, I voted for him. Sam is a great guy. He works across the aisle. So does Mary Fossey. Please, this is the season of goodwill. President Stone Cypher, please pull this ordinance. Let's get down to the business. You've heard the people here with the real concerns that are going on. This is not one of them. If she wasn't doing her job, I would stand right here and tell you. But I'm going to tell you, she is always prepared. Last year we had, what, 17, 1800 bills? Every single one of them. I had to track 87 of them. 87 of them. And I've been down there this week. I haven't been home before 1030 in five days. I understand exactly what each one of you do. I'm not a public servant, but I serve my members statewide in northern Idaho. So please move forward with the important business here. Spread that goodwill. It's Christmas season. Let's take care of that. Move forward. You got a good person here. Each one of you should cherish not only her, but each other. Sorry about that. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, I don't get to come up here very often and speak, but thank you. Thanks. Thank you, President Stonecipher. That concludes this portion. And then the remaining I have want to wait till we get to item 18. Okay, great. Thank you. And with that, we are moving on to council comments and liaison reports, starting with Vice President Dewey. Well, thank you. I want to thank everybody who is here tonight. Um, I assume we're going to hear from a few more folks later, but uh, really appreciate uh, all of your thoughts, your concerns. And I know that I personally want to really help the Delta neighborhood with the park situation. And I know that um, try to make that a higher priority so that we do get some of the ideas that we've talked about before. I know Ryan and I have talked with a few of those. Um, we had a great meeting before tonight, and I'll let the chair of the human of the health and human services talk about that. But Mary Jane from um, MJ from Snohomish County was here, and lots of great things are happening there. Um, I want to congrats to Dan Templeman. Glad to see he's coming back. And I would like to make a proposal um, for 2024 that each council member. Um, be able to allocate an additional $100,000 out of the COVID recovery funds. We've had some projects not go through. We still have some balance, so hopefully there's enough. I think our collective um, allocations for 2023 have been amazing, and I think that they support a broad range of folks in our community in many different small projects that, that can help out. And, um, I think it's been really important, and if we have the funds to do so, I would like to propose that we do that for 2024 also. 
So I don't know where Thank by you. second that I need second. a second. I would Thank you. Gladly third. <laughs> so I, I will, I'll just say um, thank you. Uh, uh, Vice President uh, Tui let me know about this, that she would be proposing this. And I did speak with our finance department. So I think they're prepared to make that amendment in the budget when that comes up. That's when we would, I, I believe, make that amendment. Um, but I did give the heads up to the team. So I think you might have to re-engage that conversation when that item is before us. OK. Thank you. And that's tonight. Yes. OK. Great. Love to do that. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Councilmember Ryan. Great. Good evening, everybody. Standing room only, my favorite kind of meeting. Uh, first, I want to give a shout out to our nurses. I saw uh, some folks here earlier tonight, but uh, yes, tiny clap. <laughs> um, hand wave. There you go. Um, shout out to the nurses at Providence Regional Med Medical Center Everett for coming to a uh, a conclusion on contract negotiations and I believe it still needs to be finalized but that's just such a huge relief for the, all of the community and uh, knowing that our nurses are being taken care of and in return taking care of the community so a uh, big shout out to our nurses for their diligence with that uh, just quick uh, several quick comments first if you haven't had a chance to check out the Arboretum winter tide lights definitely check that out it's a free event up at the Arboretum each night until uh, the 31st I believe uh, the Port Gardner Neighborhood Association has a holiday lighting competition. So if you're in the park, Port Gardner area and you see some a neighbor with great lights, uh, please nominate them. There's more information on my Facebook page on how the nominations can happen. Um, earlier, late, la late last week, I met with Jennifer to talk about state legislative priorities that I have for uh, this next uh, session. And I already have a couple of bill numbers for you to pass along that I've uh, come across my inbox. So I look forward to more collaboration on our legislative priorities. And yes, uh, earlier this evening, we had our Health and Human Services <coughs> Committee meeting and uh, Mary Jane from the, the Director of Human Services with the county came and shared more about the, um, the partnership and collaboration that the city has with the county to help uh, with addressing human service related projects and programs across the county and here in Everett. And it's just been a, it's been a long time, strong relationship, and I appreciate the continued work that they do. Uh, one of the things I would like to highlight is that there is a mention that there are 201 beds for uh, families uh, experiencing homelessness at a uh, temporary shelter overnight in the county, uh, plus uh, 311 individual beds, or about a total of 512 beds that are available for temporary overnight shelter. However, last year's uh, point in time count, the count that happens to count the number of homeless people um, sleeping unsheltered on any on a given night in January was about 1,200 people, so it leaves a delta of over 600 people a night that don't have a safe, stable place to sleep indoors. So I just want folks to keep that in mind, especially when we're experiencing the weather like we're experiencing tonight. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Vokley. Thank you. Um, <coughs> our agenda is quite full this evening. Um, and in preparation for this full agenda, I came across a few items that we haven't addressed lately. And it was amazing to see Steve Ose and that, well, he didn't remind me, but um, the transit merger study, I believe the last time we spoke about it, uh, the timeline for completion was June or August. And I'm wondering if we have a new timeline for that. I think President Stone Safer, you might've been on that. Yeah, I'm on, I serve on that committee and we are the new timeline, the study, I don't know, the study's coming up. I mean, you remind me, um, it's postponed until January for sure, but. Yeah, so so the, the work of the kind of committee has happened and it's now in this place where uh, the question should come back to the community as to what are the pros and cons of this work. Uh, we can uh, probably have uh, both uh, Tom Hinkson as well as um, Roland from Community Transit uh, give an update to one of our committees uh, that might kind of give a fuller status of that. But at the at the time, there's, there's no, there's nothing happening because it's it's just kind of hit pause and i know we'll have a council transition uh in the coming year which will bring a new member to that committee uh but yeah it's sorry it's been a couple months since they met and it's not fresh in my mind right now but i will talk to the team and make sure you have an update okay thank you um and then also the redistricting handbook i see paula mm -hmm. council out there but um 
I'm not even sure if there was a timeline for the redistricting handbook, but I'm curious how far along we are, and I think that was Council Member Dewey that was working on that. Yeah, and we haven't met to talk about it for a while, so we'll have to get back into that. Okay, I just want to put that out there. I know that districting, redistricting won't happen for another nine years, but it would be nice. Um, and I'm thankful that Paula, Council Member Ryan brought up legislative priorities and talking with Jennifer because I keep rereading that email and having so much else to do that I haven't responded. Yeah, let's get together. So that's my formal. Yeah, let's get together because I do have some priorities and I would like to share that. Um, that's the general stuff. Thank you all for being here and voicing your opinions. I know sometimes it's scary and you don't think that things are going to happen whether you say anything or not. So um, I hope that things happen whether you say them or not. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Schwab. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Great turnout tonight. I appreciate it. I know you all have families and you all have other responsibilities. Um, and thank you for taking the time and speaking your voice. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, just to make it short, congratulations to Dan Templeman. Although I did publicly, I did <clears throat> told him, gave him some advice about retirement. Wouldn't be the top choice. I think he's going to be just as busy as he was before. But uh, great choice. Um, I'm thankful that he's still willing to serve in a dis different capacity. And I know this is a repeat, but um, I'm very, very thankful that. Um, UFCW has reached a tentative agreement. I, I would like to. I hopefully it's a. I hopefully it's a good, a good um, contract, and um, hopefully it goes well. I know there's some here in the room, so I've been very very concerned about that for way too long. So I'm very very thankful for that, not only for the workers but for the community at large. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Fossey. I will also make it short because it looks like we might still have a few people to speak. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and showing up and speaking. I really wish uh, the cameras could show the people, like the volume of folks that are here. Um, I, I share the the happiness uh, of my colleague in when we have these rooms filled with people that come out and want to speak and be involved and make change and have their voices heard because uh, this is this is how things happen. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to uh, also everyone that has signed up to serve uh, and been appointed uh, by the mayor uh, to our different boards and commissions. Um, that's another great way to get involved. And I know you all know that uh, public service isn't, isn't always an easy gig. Um, especially when you're doing those jobs that are, when you're doing it for the right reasons. And for some folks, it's easier to get there. And for others, it, it can be an uphill battle. So I'll, I may have more to say later, or you may all say it for me, but, um, The Health and Human Services Committee, Paula covered that, but I encourage you all to watch that video. Uh, it has a lot of really interesting uh, information on it. Uh, Wintertide uh, Lights and Solstice uh, Luminary Walk is coming up on uh, the 21st uh, at 6 p.m. Um, and then they will have lights every night for from 4 to 8. So um, congratulations to our Arboretum for celebrating its 60th anniversary and thank you to the approximately 400 hours of uh, volunteer time that people put in to make that happen and uh, please be charitable and kind this season. 
Council Member Zerlingo. Uh, yes, I'd second be charitable and kind. Um, uh, and I guess uh, a range of things, uh, one of them with respect to some of the requests about uh, safety and city resources, that kind of thing. As uh, Mayor Franklin has said, we have big questions and decisions ahead of us for that. We hope to be able to bring to our community members the kind of choices that will determine what kinds of things we can do and, and what the city provides with the small chunk of their taxes, of your taxes that they get. Uh, thanks to C. Dose for the reminder uh, that Fred Meyer is talking about. It's in my neighborhood, so I look forward to being there. Um, was glad to hear about the uh, labor agreement with the nurses in Providence, um, especially that it focused on staffing. I know that was a critical issue. Um, though the one thing I would like to say, especially where we've got people here who care about their community and who are involved in this, is the issues behind this are so much bigger, broader, and more intractable than the, even the labor agreement was. So please get involved. Uh, those issues have a lot to do with state and national policy. So um, you can help make a difference that way, agitate with respect to your, your state representatives and, and then uh, nationally with your federal representatives because those policies and our very dysfunctional or nearly dysfunctional healthcare system has a lot to do with those deeper issues. Uh, so certainly if you want to get involved, if you want to make that better, that's the level at which to do it. We here in the council are sadly not much powerful in, in doing something about that. Uh, some good news uh, attended this morning, uh, Boeing's North Sound uh, fourth quarter update. You know, everybody knows, I think they're a major factor in our economy. Uh, the workforce, they're the core and the origin, origin here of a whole aerospace cluster. Um, it's especially consequential now that they're doing the hard work to bring a new fourth 737 MAX line here to Everett. That's an aircraft, um, I don't know how many, more than $100 million each. There are something like 6,000 firm orders uh, in the book there. The work then is to get that stuff going. And it's uh, no mean feat to turn that portion of the uh, big uh, factory into the first um, single aisle uh, airplane produced there. Uh, we heard more about the specifics there. Uh, they're remodeling buildings, access, parking for people. I know that's a huge issue uh, for Boeing. Uh, and they've also been doing quite a bit of hiring. We'll be doing more of that. And um, I was especially gratified from the standpoint of working and in taxes and that sort of thing that they expect to be rolling the first 737 MAX aircraft out of the Boeing at plant uh, by this time next year. So this is something that's a time coming, but now coming uh, fairly soon. So uh, happy to hear about that. Uh, and also they'll be able to offer some uh, 737 line tours for the first time. And that's got significance in terms of our, uh, of our tourism economy, the tourist center, and the other tourist um, the other tourist destinations here. And that leads me to my second point, uh, the Imagine Children's Museum, which was hosting this morning's uh, meeting. It was the first time I'd been in the new building. If you haven't seen that major new expansion, which they managed to do in the face of a, of a global pandemic and being closed for something like 18 months. Uh, you know, congratulations to them. But it isn't just a local thing. It's the largest children's museum in the Northwest. And it becomes another tourist destination. And what we're trying to get, I think, uh, Economic Director, uh, Ernesty talks about sort of a five attractions kind of collection that you can start to bring people from uh, outside the, about, well, outside the city, outside the county, from the region, and sometimes other states here uh, with things like the uh, Flying Heritage Museum, of course, the Boeing Tours, and, uh, and other museums and attractions and what's going on in Seattle. So that's a real benefit to all of us because just like all of those airplanes that fly out of the Boeing factory, that brings outside of the region income into this area. It makes us all more prosperous, gives us all more options in addition to the employment. Of course, the thing we all know is we need to work more on housing for that. That's going to be a persistent issue. Uh, but also, uh, with the Children's Museum, it's a chance to, um, to have leverage in our children's lives, to introduce children at the youngest ages to nature, to science, uh, technology, hands-on experience, that can help them have much better, more fulfilling lives and, and fulfill their potential. So I'm especially in favor of the, of the Children's Museum because that, that touches people when you can make the biggest difference in their lives. Uh, quick note, uh, we attended yesterday the uh, ribbon cutting for the new Chick-fil-A restaurant at the 
at the west edge of Everett Mall at Everett Mall Way. Uh, the official uh, opening, I think, is tomorrow. So uh, whether you're a, an enthusiast for chicken restaurants or not, uh, this also is now a way to bring in uh, more prosperity for our city. And also to mean that uh, if you want that kind of food, then you don't need to leave Everett to go get it. Uh, they're working hard to manage traffic, sometimes a real issue with the Chick-fil-A restaurants. They have the benefit here of a, <coughs> of a kind of a greenfield site where they could start and manage that circulation from the beginning. Uh, so I'm happy to see that there. Um, well, let's see. I think in the interest of the large number of other things that are on the agenda, I'll quit with that tonight. Thank you. And I don't have very many comments. I wanted to thank uh, everyone who showed up tonight to be at our meeting. I, too, agree that it's fun to have a packed house, especially for one of my last meetings. Um, and I have, uh, I'll have some other comments to make when we get to item 18. Um, I did want to correct the record that I ha would find it. I don't have the numbers, but I do not believe that there's any chance I could have missed 11 meetings this year because I chair the meeting, and we've only met about 45 meetings so far this year. So I am certain I did not miss a quarter of those. but. I will get the numbers as I am want to do, and we'll uh, correct that record next week. Uh, do we have an administrative update this evening? Uh, yes, so thank you to the mayor, chief, and some council members who have already checked off some of the things on my list that was longer, now it's shorter. Uh, so just three items, one, um, Councilmember Schwab, uh, at the last meeting, and perhaps before that too, has asked about the um, VOA Women and Children's Pallet Shelter the community meeting that they held. Um, all the comments that were made there will be uh, evaluated by the permit team as they review and apply the code provisions. They'll share that permit decision with everyone who's commented so far. If anyone uh, participated just verbally and didn't give us their name or address at that community meeting, they can always reach out um, to me or to you, back to me, um, or to the project planner. We'll make sure that they get that copy at, the, um, at that stage. Um, Council Member Vogley, we do have um, a briefing on the transit merger tentatively scheduled for your January 31st meeting of the Council. Um, and, uh, and then the last one, uh, we are appreciative of your work tonight to pass the 2024 budget. Um, that timing is important. Um, and I'll let Susie probably address this a little bit further, but um, Council Pres Vice President to your um, suggestion on the COVID recovery funds, it's possible that we might want to recommend that we hold that to a first um, budget amendment at the beginning of the year, just uh, so that we make tonight's process maybe a little cleaner. But we de definitely understand the desire and, and are really appreciative of all the investments that um, almost all of you have um, elected to make with those funds and totally get where you're going with that. But Susie will, she'll have the final word on it when she comes up here and, uh, and shares her comments. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. And now we go to our assistant city attorney, Flora Diaz. Welcome. It's nice to have you. Thank you. Uh, no report, no request for an executive session. Thank you. Uh, we will move to our consent agenda. Do I hear a motion for the seven consent items? So moved on the consent items. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second for the consent agenda. Clerk, we please call the roll. Vice President Tui? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? Yes. Councilmember Vogley? Yes. Councilmember Schwab? Yes. Councilmember Fossey? Yes. Councilmember Zarlingo? Yes. President Stonecipher? Yes. Uh, next, we'll go to our proposed action items. We have 12 proposed items, but I will be reading items 11 through 19 uh, into the record because they are first readings and need to be read. Item 11, Council Bill 2311-63, first reading. Adopt an ordinance closing a special improvement project entitled 17th Street Interceptor Upgrades. Fund 336, Program 020, as established by ordinance number 3806-21. Third and final reading will be on December 20th. Item 12 is Council Bill 2311-65, first reading. Adopt an ordinance closing a special improvement project entitled Grand Avenue Utilities Replacement Fund 336, Program 014, as established by Ordinance Number 3762-20. Third and final reading will be on December 20th. Item 13, Council Bill 2311-66. First reading, adopt an ordinance closing a special improvement project entitled Lift Station Number 15 and Shore Avenue Force Main. Fund 336, Program 005, as established by Ordinance Number 3725-20. Third and final reading will be on December 20th. Council Bill uh, number 14 is Council Bill 2311-67. First reading, 
adopt an ordinance closing a special improvement project entitled Maple Heights Bridge Seismic Retrofit Fund 303 Program 113 as established by ordinance number 3603-18. Third and final reading will this will also be on December 20th. Council Bill 2311-68 is our item 15, first reading. Adopt an ordinance closing a special improvement project entitled Reservoir Number 2 Replacement Fund 336 Program 017 as established by ordinance number 3792-20. Third and final reading will be on December 20th. Item 16, Council Bill 2311-69. First reading, adopt an ordinance closing a special improvement project entitled SEI to SRI, Intertie, and SR008, Rehabilitation Fund 336, Program 010, as established by ordinance number 3735-20. Third and final reading will be on December 20th. Item 17, Council Bill 2311-71, first reading. Adopt an ordinance closing a special improvement project entitled Water Main Replacement W, Fund 336, Program 023, as established by ordinance number 3813-21. Third and final reading will be on December 20th. Item 18, Council Bill 2311-73, first reading. Adopt an ordinance prohibiting city council members from holding other elected offices. Third and final reading will be on December 20th. And item 19, Council Bill 2312-75, first reading, an ordinance creating a special improvement project entitled Lift Station Number 15, Fund 336, Program 041. Third and final reading will be on December 20th. Are there any questions or comments on any of the proposed action? Councilmember Vogley. Uh, number 10, really quick, because everything has <coughs> just been there's been so much of it. That's the Loganberry Trail enhancements. Um, and I know Ms. Bodge uh, had mentioned that. But so many items have had such time commitment that I failed to mention my pleasure and support for the Loganberry Trail enhancements and the work that will be done, not only for the ease of use for people, but also for the restoration and protection of our natural environment. And I also wanted to now off the cuff mention, uh, she said, um, concerned about all of the makeshift trails that have been made and I can say that it will be for safety as well that these enhancements are being done. Uh, I have personal experience of a neighbor who has been accosted on such trails. So um, this is also for public safety in my opinion. I don't know if it's put out that way. But, um, and I, probably have something to say about uh, 18 as well. But I wanted to make sure I got number 20. I mean 10. Thank you. Councilmember Zarlingo. Uh, just a quick a quick note about uh, item number 16, this intertie. The current pipe in that area is 105 years old, has significant defects and deterioration. Now I bring that up just because the questions we get in terms of how the city spends its money, the money that comes not only from taxes but from utility fees and all that, there's a lot of thought that goes into that. And I guess on the one hand, I can lament a 105-year-old pipe. On the other hand, I can say thanks to our public utilities for making something last that long uh, so, so that we all can all depend on our public utilities. So anyway, that's it. I just don't want that to go unnoticed. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Do we do questions or comments before we do public comment? I, yeah, any questions or comments from the council first? Anybody else? I will have some afterwards. Okay. A council member, uh, Vogley. Uh, number 18, will you, as the bringer of the proposal, be speaking to it? I will. I will. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Any comments on any other items? Okay, so I will speak to item 18, having brought this forward. And um, first of all, I want to say that a friend has checked the clerk's records and I missed two meetings in 2023. Um, so wanted to correct that. Also, um, just wanted to uh, say that my intention for this ordinance uh, is, is honestly not personal or political. Um, I think in the comments that were brought forward uh, last week, um, my main comment and, and concern about holding multiple offices is not the partisanship. I think that's a very minor issue. In fact, uh, it is I who chose the ordinance that allows uh, a council member to 
serve in a PCO capacity, which is an obviously very partisan position, um, but it's an unpaid position that doesn't require any uh, or very many hours of work and not, um, it's not as demanding as the legislature, for example. And so my observations have been multifold, um, but last session, uh, you know, it was very difficult to manage the, uh, the workload for the rest of the council members, and I would say with only two exceptions, uh, my colleagues were concerned about being asked to support and attend other meetings outside of their own duties. Um, and so that was very difficult as the leader and the president of the council to kind of juggle and try to see how are we going to cover neighborhood meetings, how are we going to cover the other obligations of being a council member that don't happen on Wednesday night in this uh, chambers. There's a lot of things that we do outside of our time here. So, um, so that was one factor that I believed uh, was really important for us to think about and the other factor being if we had multiple council members that were serving in other capacities it would be very difficult to man even more difficult to manage that meeting and no one no one really begrudged doing extra um, duties and responsibilities but uh, but it is a factor that you have to take into account and so um, I think it's very difficult. Uh, you know, obviously the legislative body works extremely hard, not only during those four months or two months or how, however long the session is this time, but they are also um, have a lot of demands on them at other times. I think there is another um, element to city council positions, which is that this is kind of where we build the backbench for other higher elected uh, positions. This is just a public service um, or a, a service position you know this isn't a job for most of us here um, it's something that we like to do and we do willingly and um, this is where we kind of set the ground for people that might eventually serve in the legislature or the school board or other um, higher elected bodies and I think that having multiple people represent us is a uh, good for the diversity of thoughts and the ideas that come forward um, so those are my reasons. Uh, I can agree to disagree with those who don't uh, support that. Um, but with that, I would certainly open it up to any public comments. Uh, there, I think there were people who wanted to um, speak at this time. Yes, so if Ethan, um, last name starts with a P, can please come to the podium, followed by Rod Ambergy, and please state your full name in the city of residence. Yeah, it's uh, Ethan Fall. So. Uh, good evening, council members. Uh, I attend these meetings quite regularly now. Normally, I'm just a fly on the wall over there, but tonight I'm going to talk. So, uh, President Stone Cipher, I'm going to agree to disagree. Uh, nothing personal. So, uh, I went back in time today and I looked at the last two years of council meetings, and you and Fossey actually missed the same amount of meetings. This year, you might have missed two, but 2022, you missed quite a few. Um, and then, uh, you know, I had this whole speech written out, but you guys, as you sit there and you listen, you guys make comments. So now I'm going to go a completely different way. Council Member Zarlingo, he said, why don't you reach out to your state representative? Look who's on the right side of you right there. You can whisper to her. Isn't that a good resource to have? I think so. I'm sure everybody here in the room can agree. You don't have to go very far to be heard. Literally, you don't even have to move. Um, it's pretty obvious with the show up here. We, we support Fosse. We support, you know, most of you. You know, again, some people win, some people lose. We all have our reasoning for why we're here, what we do. You guys have your constituents that you have to represent. Uh, in their best interest, but again, Stone Cipher, you made those comments last week. Um, you know, I think I'm just gonna leave it at that. But um, it's it's really kind of a shotgun ordinance. Uh, yeah, you don't intend to take out Fosse with this ordinance as you claim, but I think she's gonna be a casualty. So let's. Uh, 
I'd like you to pull this ordinance and, and really think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Rod, please come to the podium, followed by Paul Gallivan. Rod Ambergy. They look like they okay. left. Yep. Um, so Paul. And that'll be followed by Thomas Bosserman. Please state your full name and city residence. Good evening. This is Paul Gallivan. Uh, I, a lot of my family lives here in Everett. I'm uh, currently a neighbor in Marysville, and I work here in Everett. Tonight I'm here to speak on 18. President Stone Cipher, you've brought to, to this board a very decisive uh, element. You have 20 years of distinguished service, and this is a, a service position, I agree. There's a, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into doing good diligence on this. But I, I'm, I'm going to speak to uh, a lot of um, years of promises that haven't been met. Let's talk about uh, a committee that was just stalled for the last few months with no report from our committee members, no report from our uh, president who was sitting on that committee for transit. Uh, we have transit here speaking tonight, and they were nice and not talking about how you were not supporting transit. But you got their bid for a vote um, in your last election. Let's talk about the bid for a vote in your last election from the Democrats and how you're now attacking that democracy. Let's talk about the constituents that have for a long time come here to speak or not to speak, but to be heard and to have you represent them. Tonight you have that ability. I would think that any one of you could pull number 18 instead of here, this farce, go through your committee, go through your board. The only other place that this language stands that is even more disgusting is in Yakima. There is a, a one policy there out of, what, 281 cities in this state. There's three cities in this state that even address this issue. And one of them in Yakima says that you can't even serve in the military. There's a huge military base right next to Yakima, isn't there? You wonder if there's somebody on that board who was a little bit decisive and really wanted to get a casualty on the board. Okay, that time came and went, but that's, that old policy still stands today, okay? This ordinance is garbage. This ordinance is a legacy of 20 years down the drain. Your attendance over the last two years has been shameful. Maybe in the last year, you've been better than you were last year. We have other committee work that has stalled and still yet no reports from those committee members. Many, many months have gone by since we met. There's another comment made tonight. You're attacking the committee work of one representative who is an ear to the state for policies that we want to see go to the state. I'm speaking against 18. Thomas, please come to the podium, followed by Sam Hemp. And state your full name and city of residence, please. Hi, I'm Tom Bosserman. Uh, I live in Lake Stevens, but I uh, work at uh, Starbucks 37th and Broadway, so I think that's District 2. Um, so, just a thought regarding the, I'm here to speak about 18. I'm, I don't know if that's a shock to anybody, but, um, so I've heard some concerns about, I mean, this, this is the only new information that I've received and everyone else has spoken so eloquently that I just wanna, it's the committee thing. Uh, so um, just a thought, I mean, if there's a great concern about attendance at, uh, at, at committee meetings, why not make some some kind of percentage or number of attendance to committee meetings a requirement rather than try to uh, cut the legs out out, un, out from under people who uh, are capable of serving in in more than one elected position capacity? I mean, uh, I guess that would mean that everybody else would also have to be required to attend their committee meetings um, then. It seems like that 
is the only thing I've heard that sounds remotely compelling um, from President Stonecipher. So why not try to pass an ordinance about that instead? Um, so for that reason, I would recommend pulling 18. Anyway, uh, it does seem like this is a, a big change in the way that the city does business. You have a charter. Um, it doesn't address this. Presumably, it wasn't of uh, great um, concern to those who wrote the charter. Uh, I realize you have the power to either amend the charter, which would frankly be a more um, honest approach to this matter than trying to do it by an ordinance. Um, but even better would be to bring this before the voters, uh, put it on the ballot, uh, uh, or someone who'd like to run against uh, Mary or anyone else who holds two positions. Maybe they could mention it in their campaign and see how the voters felt about it if they thought it was a giant concern. Um, anyway, that's pretty much all I have to say about the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Fidencio, please come. Please come to the uh, podium. State your full name and city of residence, followed by Ryan Weber. Hello, everybody. My name is Sam Hem, a proud citizen of District 1 in the city of Everett. Um, usually, when I get up and I speak, I also introduce what I do for a living, but quite frankly, that's none of your business, right? Um, and I think it's none of your business what any other council member does for their other position. This is a part time position. I'm offended that this is even here. Um, I've only disagreed with one other one comment that everyone that's spoken against 18 before me has said, and that is that Mary Fossey is my representative, right? I'm uh, my representative on District 1 and my representative on the 38th District. Um, I brag about that to a lot of people. I brag that I, I, can, I can make a phone call and I can have a conversation and I can talk about how I'm impacted in the city of Everett and I can talk about how I'm impacted at the state. Um, my representatives in one person hears me and hears, and hears uh, not only my voice but the voice of my neighbors and carries that forward. The fact that this ordinance has the potential to be passed is appalling. I think it should be withdrawn, um, but short of that, it should be voted down um, almost unanimously. Um, I also think that uh, this ordinance is taking away my right as a U.S. citizen to vote. Um, and that's, a, that's absurd to me. And I'll just close with shame on you. Ryan, please come to the podium, followed by Shana Langley. Please okay. state your full name. Fidencio? Yeah. Oh. Right. My apologies. Yes. Fidencio? <laughs> yes. Uh, Fidencio Velasco. Um, you know, it's been told to me many times, man, you must love politics. And I always return to them. I go, man, I hate politics. I hate the games that have to be played to get the stuff done that we need to get done. You know, Mary Fossey, class act, you know, speaks for the members of this community in this district that she represents in the first district, which I am a, a resident of this district, you know, um, in the 38th. What drives me nuts is that, Paula Ryan, you, you do it too. And I don't believe that this ordinance has anything to do with what you're presenting. I believe this is a direct attack on labor. You know, we've been pushing this PLA language for the last year. Since 2019, we've had you, Mayor, push a, a piece of legislation that appeased us. You know, Miguel and I, we fought for you. But tonight, we're putting you on notice. We're not doing that no more. We think this is a direct attack on labor. Thank God you three aren't, you know, elected officials because we think this is this that's what this whole issue is about. This has nothing to do. Three cities in the state of Washington out of 281 have this ordinance. There's a reason behind it. I have one question for you elected officials. Before any of this, did any of you talk to each other about this ordinance? Yes? No? Yes? Nobody talks to each other on this council? No wonder we still have the crime issues that we have in the city of Everett and people are dying on the corners because of drug overdoses. If you, your job is to work for the constituents of this city, not what you think is right or not what you think is right, Mayor. What this city needs, you, Zerlingo, your priorities two years ago, homelessness, balanced budget, funding for public safety, promote responsible development. 
promote responsible development, why were you against the PLA? That's responsible development for the workers that work in this city. That's who, responsible development. You have crime scenes all over the city of Everett going on. Wage theft is killing people. Number two cause of death in the construction industry is suicide. Number one cause most people commit suicide because of financial reasons or they feel they don't belong in a community. This is a direct attack on labor and that's what we believe. Western States Regional Council of Carpenters Act ask you, start working with each other and represent the people that you were all elected to represent. So in Cypher, this is a grenade. We don't know who asked you to hold on to it. We're not sure, you could care less. You just said this is one of your last meetings. You're walking out, this is a bomb garner issue just like he tried to pull right to work in the state of Washington. And the same thing happened. You keep doing this, labor's gonna keep showing up. You want a PLA, don't appease us. That task force was a waste of my time. You put us in a room with a bunch of dogs. All we did was argue, nothing got done. If you want a PLA in the city of Everett, Start working with us. Stop giving us lip service. Ryan, please come to the podium. Who's that? Ryan. Yeah. And please state your full name again and city residence. Okay, my name Thank is Ryan you. Weber, um, Delta District One. Uh, uh, well, a lot has been said. Um, I just wanted to come out in support of Mary on this. Um, I just think it's best to leave it to the voters to decide. And voters voted full well knowing, the second time that is, knowing that this would be two positions. Um, city Council is part-time as much as I wish it was full-time so that we could get more things done in the city. <laughs> um, it's a part-time job, and I think there are benefits to having more connections at the state level. I think, I think, or I, I'm pretty sure that we miss out on opportunities of state funds, you know, not always having the right connections, getting together, looking for, you know, grant funds or changes to state law that would benefit Everett. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I guess I would prefer not to have the council really deciding or dictating who who we can vote for. And yeah, I think let's leave it to the voters to decide those things. Thank you. Thank you. Shana, please come to the podium, followed by Brian Johnson. Please state your full name and city residence. Hi, everyone. My name is Shana Langley, and I'm a teacher and a neighbor in Glacier View neighborhood. Um, I also volunteer my time on Washington Education Association's political action team, uh, working to make sure incredible candidates like Mary Fossey actually get uh, voted for in office and make a difference for our kids and our community. Um, today I wish to address the proposed ordinance concerning council members holding dual elected positions that specifically targets council member Fossey. I question the intent behind this proposal, especially uh, due to the timing. I think conflicts of interest are an important part of transparency and accountability, but uh, this ordinance clearly uh, is about achieving a political agenda. Um, and there are more important things you should be trying to solve, as is apparent by all of the testimony tonight. Um, and to be honest, your reasons were mostly word salad. Um, and if you think it's very difficult to hold two positions, then um, you can choose not to serve two positions. Um, first, under Washington state law, holding dual offices is perfectly legal and entirely democratic. This proposed ordinance, which is more restrictive than our own state law, limits the uh, pool of highly qualified individuals who can serve in our community, um, specifically Mary Fossey. Uh, it is imperative that our local laws do not unnecessarily narrow the scope of our civic participation. From a practical standpoint, council members like Mary Fossey with experience in other elected roles can offer invaluable perspectives, enriching our council's decisions and making our community better. Concerns about workload are understandable, yet it is ultimately the responsibility of each elected official to manage their own commitments effectively. History shows us that many professional, professionals, like myself included, as a teacher, I do many other things, um, can balance multiple roles without compromising their effectiveness. 
Democratically, it's crucial to emphasize that we, the voters, have the right to elect candidates that uh, we believe are most qualified, even if those candidates hold other positions. This ordinance will unduly restrict voter choice, which is a cornerstone of our democratic process. In terms of nonpartisanship, while political affiliations are a concern, they do not necessarily hinder nonpartisan decision making. Effective leaders, much like skilled educators, are adept at setting aside personal biases for the greater good. As alternative solutions, I propose implementing measures that enhance transparency and accountability. Things like mandatory disclosures about other elected positions and uh, potential conflicts of interest. Additionally, processes such as a system of periodic reviews for council members with multiple roles could ensure that they are managing their responsibilities effectively um, without compromising their duties to the city council and might benefit the other city council members on this board. To end, this ordinance is undemocratic and honestly not very well thought out in both the short and the long term. Um, and if you want to do things like attract new businesses and contracts with big companies like Boeing, just remember that bad politics loses business. Um, I urge the council to reflect on the impact of this decision and make a better choice. We are watching. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Please come to the podium, followed by Paula Townsell, and state your full name and city residence, please. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm Ryan Johnson from Arlington. Uh, I'm going to speak to 18, but before I do that, I'm a member of Arlington Washington Pride. And this should have been done long before now, but my schedule is horrible. I want to thank you guys for the resolution you passed in support of us. Let there be zero doubt that there were multiple members of the city administration and city employees who were actively encouraging violence against our event. You guys really stuck your neck out when you didn't have to. And especially Councilman Fossey and Councilman Vogel, Councilman Vogel, if you, made, you let the city know that people were watching, and that did make all the difference in the world. And the first thing that happened that night when Councilman Vogel came to our city council meeting to read your support of us was the city attorney who said for months that the 250 foot open carry rule did not apply. He was going to be reviewing that. He folded that night. On to resolution 18, so please, if there's any doubt that you guys made a difference, there is no doubt, you did make a difference. And if another group like us comes to you again and asks for your support, please support them. I probably would have gotten shot had had multiple members of the state government not stepped in. Now under Resolution 18, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I cannot think of any reason why any city council would not want to have a state representative on it. That is a massive advantage to any city council. It doesn't even make any sense. Politics is about connections, is about who you know and who can work what system the best. Obviously, judging by the comments of many Everett residents tonight, doesn't seem like some of you are working the systems very good and you're trying to make it harder to work the systems you have. This is just ridiculous. Mary Fossey's voters know who Mary Fossey is. They have spoken. Listen to them. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Please come to the podium and state your full name and city residence, followed by Kelly Johnson. Thank you, Paula Townsell, District three resident. Um, thank you for hearing us all tonight, elected officials. I had a lot of questions after listening to council last week in the prequel for the proposed ordinance on restricting the elected service for council members. The proposed ordinance only addresses the one question, is the council more qualified than voters to select who serves? Our part-time city council members typically have full-time jobs, families, community commitments ranging from Little League to church. Could there be conflicts of time and duties? That should be for the members to work to avoid and confront when needed. I trust our elected council members to exercise their judgment. Members are multifaceted people with diverse interests, backgrounds, and experiences. It becomes too subjective when we get into the weeds on capacity of specific individuals, degree of integrity, and more. I'm troubled that the restrictions proposed by this ordinance are far too deep and specific in limitation of paid elected offices. It seems to be unnecessary and targeted at a granular level. 
It allows current council to broad brush a restrictive ordinance while failing to trust the voters who should be the ultimate decider of who sits on our council and has the power to place council members in additional elected offices too. There's no violations of the state RCWs or the WACs, but this ordinance does suggest that by a simple majority of council, you know better than the state and the local voters. I respectfully disagree. Is there benefit to having a greater voice for the city's needs outside of the municipal parameters of the business of the city? Would a school board director provide more diversity of knowledge in discussions of homeless students, addiction issues with juveniles? Would a port commissioner provide more diversity in discussion on maritime commerce and naval station needs? Would a state legislator provide more diversity in discussion on transit or aviation? What about a utility commissioner? The diversity of knowledge for any office elected or volunteered provides immeasurable benefit to the city council's discussions. Just as members' day jobs bring immeasurable benefits to this council. Could there be conflicts of time and duties? Oh yes, life is full of conflicts. It involves daily conflicts, and that is for individual candidates to consider before running for office, and for voters to ask questions and cast informed ballots. Voters should have the ultimate say, and I trust voters. They're my family, my neighbors, my community, and they're all of you. I look forward to seeing the outcomes of each and every election. It's amazing. Democracy in action. I'm asking you to let the voters decide who is elected into each office, and I'm asking you to vote against this overreaching ordinance. Thank you for your time. Kelly, please come to the podium. Please state your full name and city of residence. Um, full name is Kelly Johnson, and I live here in Everett. Um, I've been here a few times in the past year, and I have to say this is the most people I have ever seen. And I don't know if that's the real what reason why this was put on the uh, agenda or trying to pass it, just because you missed everyone's voices and you really wanted to promote dialogue. But um, here we are. Um, a benefit that I want to acknowledge, I know a lot of people have mentioned that having someone who has dual positions, that there's benefits, and I think nurses of Everett have been able to experience that in real time, so I don't want that to be minimized. Um, part of that example was um, having someone on city council and in the state legislature means that the Everett community has an even stronger voice of representation at the state level. Members on the city council have a better grasp of concerns and issues facing Everett due to having more opportunities to interact and hear from constituents. That feedback can be used at the state level. I know for me, being able to come to city council numerous times pertaining to the public safety issues at Providence <coughs> Hospital has given me and other nurses a space to share our concerns with our elected officials and the community. I do hope that while the point was made that the city council cannot pass measures to address the staffing issues at the hospital and that it needs to be addressed at the state and federal level, that nurses are not being made to feel like they can't come to city council to provide updates and concerns that impact the community. I hope that this is a continued space where nurses can provide public comment on the issues at the hospital affecting the community it cares for. Noting that measures can't be passed here um, in the city council, they can be passed on the state level. And having had a person on the council that was a representative at the state actually encouraged nurses to participate more on the state level than they had historically ever before. And I do believe that that had a significant impact on the passing of the staffing bill. We had more nurses who participated in public comment at the hearings. We had more nurses participate in just being able to vote yes or no on the bill. And we had more nurses simply just reaching out to their legislators. So please don't undermine that that benefit that exists here. Lastly, I just want to say it kind of sounds a little bit like an internal matter that needs to be addressed within the group. I can understand that it might be frustrating to feel like you're picking up someone else's work, but this should be an environment where you guys can have those conversations together and be able to resolve them without involving the community. This has now involved the community in a manner where it's risking our voices being compromised. Um, I hope that 
generally speaking, we trust voters are educated enough to know when they are electing a person into multiple elected offices and can assess if they are working hard or not, and that we can vote accordingly. This move kind of signals that members of the council may not trust that voters know best, so I ask to reconsider passing this ordinance. Thank you, and that concludes our public comments. Well, let me start with kind of working from the back. Uh, I'm sorry if my discussion about where you might most effectively improve the difficult health care situation in our country was, um, was not interpreted the way I intended. I'm absolutely happy to have public comment, to have the nurses involved, and I think it's a really interesting aspect that had not occurred to me that uh, them coming here and getting... Um, getting the experience of public comment and addressing a legislative body uh, in person got them encouraged to do that more in areas where there's more power and more ability to affect that. So I hope, I'm happy to hear that part of it. I did not mean to, uh, to um, mislead anyone, but I also don't want people to miss their best chances to affect this. Um, and again, the state level is where, the, is where a big chunk of it is and also the national level. Uh, but anyway, I certainly welcome any comments uh, that we get from anybody on that and, 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 and listen every time. Um, the comment earlier about mandatory disclosures, that's an interesting aspect, actually. I don't think I'm the only one who's gotten an official inquiry to, uh, to know all of the committees and uh, boards I'm on uh, so that there are uh, databases out there. But then again, the fact that there are data, and some of this is on the PDC, the Public Disclosure Commission's database. Um, but the fact that there, are public, that there are databases out there doesn't mean that people necessarily have those. So I guess that's an opportunity for us to look at is maybe, uh, maybe a disclosure of the, of the council members and the, the other things that they're on. Because it certainly isn't hidden in my case. I responded extensively to that, uh, and I'm happy to do that. And, and if there are either perceived or real conflicts, I'd love those to be brought to my attention. Uh, another element, uh, I want to make it clear, uh, the. Uh, the originator of the ordinance here in question uh, was uh, Council President Stonecipher. Uh, it did not come from administration. Uh, there were some initial discussions, but basically um, I uh, agreed to second this as a way to, um, to explore it. Uh, there have been questions and concerns that have come from some of our community members. There has been some emailed support uh, from community members for this ordinance. Uh, though I can imagine some of those community members might not have felt safe here tonight to express that sentiment. Um, I want to hear all those sentiments, but one of the reasons, in my opinion, that we want to avoid uh, loud disruptions and clapping and that sort of stuff is I want different people who have different opinions to feel safe to come here and express those. So I, I'm listening to all of those things. I think the entire council is. But I am concerned if, um, if, the, if the intensity of that discourages other voices. Because our jobs are to listen to those voices, no matter what they are. Certainly some of them are uh, not happy with us or don't agree. And that's all right. I'm, I'm here for that. I knew that when I decided to run for this position. Um, but at any rate, that was the reason for seconding that, so that this would get explored. These things, when they are drafted by our legal team, give us the chance to see what it would really look like. And they give our community, as they did here in an email over the past week, a chance to see what that might be and to weigh in. These things tend to be uh, trade-offs. And I, I'm, I'm happy to hear in particular, um, I mean, there are questions concern, certainly about focus and commitment, but I've paid particular attention to an issue that's been brought up not only in email, but a uh, comment here tonight about the choice and commenters uh, about whether this ordinance would interfere uh, with choices by voters and accountability that's achieved that way. Um, and this is not a black or white thing. There are choices that council members make all the time. In essence, that's representative government. Uh, we want to represent our constituents adequately uh, but then there are direct votes on these kinds of things. So that's, that's the environment we're working in, and it's a really important consideration for me. My bias is always to, um, to lean toward public involvement in this. Of course, that's why we're looking for public votes coming in terms of, um, of financing. And then the last, the last part, um, the comment about um, the um, 
joint policy committee looking at a potential uh, merger uh, between uh, Everett Transit and Community Transit. Um, you know, part of that is elected officials to try to analyze this. I've been on that committee, and um, you know, a fair number of our community members don't know the difference between Everett Transit and Community Transit. They don't know that we have two different transit agencies, one of them I don't know, like a century old. They don't know differently what sound transit does. They do buses here, the trains aren't here and aren't gonna be here for quite some time, but there are all these transit agencies. This is not something that's being um, delayed, it just takes a lot of careful consideration. I've been in on almost all of those meetings and there were considerations about um, governance, the unions, uh, the likely routes, uh, what it would all mean, and that turned out to be incredibly complicated. Um, and I don't want to rush that. I want us to do the right job on that, especially in an environment where we're talking about taxes and fees and all these things interacting with each other. We want to do the right thing for Everett. So there hasn't been some deliberate effort to uh, stop that or to cloud it up. It's just been really slow, and as you've seen, there are so many things that the council is involved in with a bunch of us part-time council people. So that's kind of the context that interweaves all of these things, but they really are uh, linked together. And, and I'm, you know, I, I'm sure the rest of the council is all trying to do their job the best they can as well. Thank you. Thank you. I must have turned that off. Sorry, other council comments? Council Member Vogley. Uh, yeah, first I just wanna make sure um, I would like to give you the op option to pull it of your own accord, pull this ordinance I, of your I own accord. I want to hear all the comments first before we consider any further action. It's not on for action tonight, so. They can be pulled like the PLA was. Um, okay. <sighs> so many of the points that I have um, have been made tonight. I think first off, the elected office of political party precinct committee officer. Um, really, also, any elected office is only as time consuming and difficult as the elected person makes it. I know here in the 38th legislative district, I don't know how the Republicans are working on their PCOs, but um, the 38th is having kind of a show these days and um, PCOs aren't necessarily getting a whole lot of work done, but boy, they could. And they serve groups of voters with differing opinions, um, such as every single political party member of their affiliation, every single person that's been endorsed by a party, um, as well as all the nonpartisan city council people. So, just wanted to put that out there for the precinct committee officer bit. Conflicting demands. Um, military service. I was super surprised to hear about the Yakima thing because there are laws prohibiting uh, discrimination against military personnel. And I know at least one of our, re he's not anymore now, he's the, Somebody might be able to help me, but we have a person in higher elected office that also serves in the military and has been gone four months at a time. Um, and yet he still, Steve Hobbs. that's the one. Thank you for that, Steve Hobbs. Um, I remember that being a thing, but it's against the law to prohibit that. And so I'm surprised with Yakima. So Yakima, if you're listening, um, parenthood, sickness of self or family, full-time work or multiple jobs, can have conflicting demands. Oh, I don't think I heard this one. What if multiple council members chose to run and get elected to another office? Uh, I think one of the things that was said last week uh, was that very thing. I can quote it exactly, but then I'd have to look it up. Um, but what if? What if all of us decided to go, well, we couldn't. There would only be two representatives, one senator, so that's three. So it's not, okay, so I'm just getting the math right. Um, but that's the same kind of scenario that we were talking about with the possibility of remote access. And what if all of us needed to have remote access? And um, 
I don't think that it was a valid argument then, and I don't think it's a valid argument now. Um, and if everybody did need to have remote access on the same day, well, we have actually, we decided that we could once a month. Um, let's see, the nonpartisan issue has been put forward. Each of us has pursued endorsements from various political groups, and if a candidate chooses to try for a dual party endorsement, like they likely get fried for trying, um, especially if they are successful. There was one recently that had that very, not here on Everett Council. Um, conflicts of interest. Oh, yes, endorsements and independent expenditures from interest groups. Um, that I believe is definitely could be a conflict of interest. Um, I've mentioned their name before. I'll hold it this time. Someone else, I think I read this in the paper, uh, so it might not have been a direct quote, and so it might have been a wrong quote, but someone else might want the position that another person has. I personally have had an opponent every time I have run. Um, so I know for sure somebody else wants this position. Absolutely. And there's probably people that want it even more now. Um, so that's a non-starter argument. Uh, and independent expenditures have put forward, okay, I'll just say it. The master builders also put forward money in their independent expenditures for my uh, most recent opponent, same as some <coughs> current ones. Um, occasionally a council position goes unchallenged. I'm gonna save that one for later. That is what I wrote in my notes. Um, and then I just want to reiterate, I think, what every, what most people have said um, today, that it's really a choice for the voters to decide. And I, if it was on a ballot out there for all of us, I would be one of this meager amount of people that actually vote in our elections, and I would vote no, that I would like to be able to vote whoever I choose to, not who somebody tells me I'm allowed to. I will cut it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Councilmember Ryan. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you. Um, first, since we are nearing Festivus, I wanted to air a quick grievance. Um, during my council comments last week, I touched on the uh, noise ordinance that would be coming before council to address street noise and that it had been presented at a public uh, safety committee, but it wouldn't be reviewed by legal for six months because they didn't have people available to do that. So for there to be a turnaround for this ordinance in less than a week, that's really frustrating for me because there's things that are quality of life issues that I know are really intensive, but the delay for things like that and then the quick turnaround for things like this is a little bit frustrating. Um, I wanted to, for my comments, uh, thank everybody for who spoke tonight. I agree with many of the things that were shared. Um, this, as a city council position, is a part-time commitment. I agree with Ryan that I wish it was a full-time position, but our salary commission, who didn't interview all of us, uh, didn't agree with that. Most of us here have other jobs, and there are most, of us, the, most of us with other jobs have full-time jobs, and families, and lives, and everything that con uh, takes up our time. And all of these things inform our work here as city council members. I don't, exclude, I don't support excluding certain types of supplemental employment from being able to serve on council. That's not my role, that's for the voters to decide. Um, so I would encourage and support the originator of the ordinance to withdraw their motion uh, for, to, for this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, any last comments? Councilmember Fossey. I guess that would be me. Okay, uh, I want to thank again everybody who has uh, come and spoken tonight. Uh, for quite a long time since I started this position, uh, there have been things that some of you know that have been going on behind the scenes that have been challenges and made it really difficult for some of the new council members coming in to serve their community the way that they should be served. And seeing all of you coming here tonight, 
um, kind of gives me the courage a little bit to speak about what this ordinance is reflective of. Uh, unfortunately, um, I find it very troubling that we do have, and a lot of you spoke to this, something like this taking away from the really, really important issues that we should be addressing right now. A lot of the new council members after districts came in and they were so eager, including myself, to make all these changes and we just kept getting barriers and barriers and barriers put in our way. And we came in, we're not, I mean, I was a neighborhood chair uh, I came in wanting to like make change. I wasn't like an elite politician. I didn't even know how a lot of those things worked. And I came in here because I was fighting for my community. I was fighting for like the working class. I came from the other side of Broadway and I knew what it was to struggle. And we get in here and I have so much hope and you know, to make that kind of change. And I just don't think the administration and some of the folks that were here were ready for that. I'm not saying the community, because the community was past due ready for those changes. And this is a, a part-time job, yes. And when I started here, I was actually working full-time at the state legislature as a staffer, which was very like, restrictive on you know someone's time. I'm part-time now at the legislature with a little bit more power and insight and access to spaces that actually helps in my dual roles. I would not recommend this for everybody. It's a lot of work to do that public service, but it feeds my soul. And I can't imagine wanting to do another job than help my community and my neighbors. I think what's happening right now is a disservice to the community and a disservice to my neighbors. And the way that, and I didn't speak last time, because I wanted a little bit of time to process, but I feel like the way I've been portrayed is disingenuous. And to correct the record, in the last two years, I am not the council member that has missed the most council meetings. That was our leadership. So in saying that, uh, people are making up for extra work and extra time. I have also been the one that's been advocating since I got elected to get, and this comes from my neighborhood background, to get our at-large seats to please visit our neighborhoods. Council Member Ryan goes to a heck of a lot of neighborhood meetings, more so than any other council member here. And, you know, props to you for all the time and effort that you put in, because that's really important work. We can't make it to every meeting. We're not uh, required to do that, but I think it's really important for people to do that. So when I asked uh, for three meetings to be covered that I couldn't make it to because I didn't have remote access at the time to something specific, in that request, uh, our assistant also put neighborhood meetings. And so, Zarlingo volunteered to go to one of the neighborhood meetings. I know they appreciated you. That wasn't an obligation. That wasn't something I'm asking for. So it was three meetings that I had asked for help with to attend the Cultural Arts Commission. And those are the ones that I'm liaisons on. It's not even a voting board. Because I've already had all my voting boards taken away from me. And I want to tell you another story that, that happened kind of in the middle of all this. And while I haven't been the most absent council member, we have been fighting for remote access because we want to be present, especially the women with children. This has been an ongoing thing. And when we finally agreed to have that this last year, it took them months to allow it, and every time I requested it, because I couldn't do a three hour commute that day because I got off of work at five and I'm like, I can't make it in time for that particular commute because this day they have me working here, I was denied remote access repeatedly until some reporter who caught on to what was going on 
reached out and all of a sudden, the last week of my other job, they allowed me to be a guinea pig for remote access. So if you don't think that this is political, one of the trips that I, I took when I drove up on Wednesday, it was a three hour drive that day. It was like two hours and 50 minutes. And I will do that because I wanted to be here. And it was a very, very short meeting. I popped over at home, you know, not too far away, right over here to, to say hi to my fam before I headed over the council. And my husband was violently ill. And he was throwing up. He couldn't, he couldn't take care of my son. My son is six. And I just had to make the split decision as a mother, a working mom, that I was still going to do my work and I was going to have to bring him with me. So I grabbed an iPad, you know, babysitter, <laughs> and brought him. And uh, luckily, one of our council members was, was out that day. So I sat him down on the iPad, short meeting, not a big deal. When I was in a neighborhood chair, we did everything we could to make that a really accessible space so we could get more inclusive participation. When we asked the Marshallese, what is the number one thing that kept you from participating in these community meetings and from volunteering, they said childcare. It was the toughest. We are in a childcare desert. It is so hard for people to be able to participate in public service that doesn't pay anything because childcare issues, life happens. The people we want up here are people that are representative of the community. I came in and I had my son here, short meeting, went home. I get a call and that call, and I wrote it down because it was so heartbreaking because it is everything that I have been working up against. How dare you? How disrespectful. Maybe you just can't do this job. But I don't know what makes you think you're entitled to childcare. We aren't running a daycare. This was all because of choices you've made. I remember that call. I didn't get a call saying, hey, what happened? That seemed, it seemed like something was going on. You don't usually bring your child. I didn't get a call saying, is everything okay? If good leadership would have reached out and said, hey, how can we make this more accessible for you? But that's not the call I got. Immediately, it was scolding me for having to bring my child because my spouse was sick to counsel. I'm a working mom. A lot of people in this community are working moms. I have two part-time jobs. It is unfortunate that some leadership has chosen to exclude certain council members with great knowledge. I, I, sit, I sit up here with a lot of really amazing folks, and there are, are certain folks that are being excluded and instead of leveraging our, our knowledge and our access and our experience, we are blocked from doing the work that our community wants us to do. There are so many more stories of frustration and barriers and hoops that we've had to jump through and we really just want to do our job. So again, I, I thank you all for coming here and speaking because it gives me you know, the courage to, to speak and share a little bit of what's been going on behind the scenes. This is exactly what democracy is, is you all being here and having your voice heard. So thank you. Any other final council comments? Well, council members Zerlingo, I, we have, I wanted to address one comment that someone said is why didn't we all just talk about this beforehand? We have an Open Public Meetings Act and so it is really not possible for council members to discuss legislation in advance because that would be kind of vote gathering and so we cannot have a, a, a majority of council members 
to collaborate on things beforehand. So thank you. Um, I worth a quick Jill. note that we also cannot do that serially, so we cannot we cannot collaborate when these things are organized. I think I can understand from a public point of view why don't you get your act together more. There's more collaboration I think we could do, but a fair amount of that that you might think we otherwise do is not legal for us to do. We, we try to be very careful about that. So we can't even do that stuff with a group of three and then a group of two with an overlapping person, for example. We end up with serial public meeting and that. Gosh, for an expert on that, we have Ramsey Rammerman here. I won't be asking him yeah. about that, but I will say that we have great legal authority on that, and we do fi try to follow that. True. Other examples were the PLA, for example. A couple council members worked on that without any knowledge of anyone else, um, and we all saw it sort of when it came on the, the agenda. Council member uh, Bogley. Uh, to add to that um, open public meeting stuff, two or three people can work on something beforehand and um, upon rewatching it, it did definitely look like there was some collaboration between the two of you. Um, so I don't know if it sounded like it was. Well, in the, in the spirit of openness in this, because I don't think there's anything to hide, at least nothing on my part, nor as far as I know on Council President Stonecipher's part, uh, she described something she was considering and a concern she had and some things she'd heard which as far as I know is exactly what she's described tonight. She asked if I would be interested in seconding that for the purpose of getting it uh, um, essentially analyzed by legal. And from my standpoint, that's also the chance for me to look at it and for us to gather public opinion, which is what's going on here. And I tried tonight, though I don't want to extend this meeting, I tried tonight to describe my process in understanding that and trying to balance the very complicated things in terms of um, of duties, responsiveness, and uh, making sure the public has their voice. Because the public doesn't have a voice in everything. You don't vote on every single thing that you do. That's what you elect us to do. But we don't want to overstep that. We want to find the right kind of balance in that and, and the right and public involvement. And that's certainly a success in this case. The process of uh, bringing it forward uh, did, uh, did illuminate the issue a bunch, not only for me, but I think for a bunch of you. And to continue, um, one thing that I've, I'm really, really happy about right now, since I started on council, I've, you've probably heard me say it before, I just want us all to have discussions. Let's talk about this stuff. And the only time we get to talk about it is right here with everybody watching. And guess what we're doing right now? We're talking about stuff and everybody's watching, and it's been going on, that's why our meetings have been so long, and the amount of things on the agenda. But, um, yeah, and we have 26, and we're on number 18, <laughs> and there's a few more discussions to have, so I'm just gonna put that out there as, <sighs> it's finally happened. And I still would, oh, I'm gonna, I don't even look over this way, because I can hear you, but I can't see you. I'm done. Councilmember Ryan. Right. Thank you for, uh, Clarifying things, I did want to touch on something Councilmember Zerlingo mentioned about committees and committee assignments. Uh, most council members have updated their council webpage with their list of committee assignments and how often they meet and uh, when, where, and how, and all that fun stuff. So there is a public facing way for people to know what our extracurricular, internal, external, uh, and neighborhood assignments are. So that's a, that information is already out there. Thanks. True, true. Uh, Mayor. Uh, th this came up a couple times here, uh, I think under Councilmember Fossey's comments, and I think Councilmember Ryan's brought it up before. Uh, it is about that time of year where uh, I have to start looking at assignments before we actually have a new council president. There's a number of assignments that I have to make as mayor prior to uh, uh, your election of a next president. And um, I was actually discussing this in my one-on-one -on -one council meeting. So when you have one-on-one -on -one meetings with me, you, you get to have these discussions. But Council Member Ryan, uh, for example, sent me a list of, hey, I'd like to do this. Um, ahead of time, if I get that from all of you, that helps me with the early decisions I have to make. And then once there's a council president, I try to work collaboratively with that person so that we have a balanced workload for everybody. So thank you. So, Please give me your request early, and that will help me with my early assignments. Thanks. Councilmember Bulkley. And there's also issues with website, and so my page, I can't update it myself, but it still has some issues. 
Thank you. Well, I appreciate, again, everyone who came tonight. I know a lot of people are already home, probably in bed. Um, and it's uh, very uh, gratifying for me to have a discussion, to hear from others. I do appreciate that we can debate you know, tough issues and think about that. I do still think that there are uh, issues on both sides. There is another um, avenue that this uh, idea can be vetted, and that would be through the Car Charter Review Commission, which I think meets in a couple years. So. Um, my proposal would be that we withdraw this proposal at this time and forward that to whoever's going to be the keeper of the Charter Review Commission at some time in the future, um, just to put that on the list of topics that they may consider looking at. They don't, you know, they don't necessarily have to, but um, to provide that to the uh, background to them for uh, discussion. And I second that, and I think if we have to second it and call a vote, I call the vote. Okay. Any any discussion before we? vote on the motion to table indefinitely I guess not even table withdraw, withdraw. motion to withdraw <clears throat> clerk please call the roll vice president Tui yes councilmember Ryan yes councilmember Vogley yes councilmember Schwab yes councilmember Fossey yes councilmember Zarlingo yes presidents don't cipher Yes, and we will now move on to our action items. Item 20, authorize the mayor to sign amendment number one to the professional services agreement with Common Street Consulting, LLC. Are we open for questions? Or what are we, oh, we need a motion. We need uh, a good motion. Evening. Oh. So moved. Sorry, thank you. Do we have a second? Do we need a second or we just have discussion first? I, I think we usually put the motion on the table. Maybe I'm mistaken, but so did I get a second? I, there was, I didn't hear a second. I'll do second it. Thank you. We've got a motion and a second. And good evening, Julie. Uh, good evening, Julie Willie, Community Development Director. And as you know, you tabled this for one week so that we had an opportunity to help Council Member Vogeli to get some of her questions answered. And we we're able, I think, to answer many of those um, regarding the work that Common Street has done over the past three months. One of the items that she did request was the November invoice, and I just wanted to let you know that we still have not uh, received that, and it's really customary to get it about the, fo the following first week of the month. So I would anticipate it coming later this week or by early next week. Um, we, did, uh, we do know that the work that they've completed thus far in de December has brought them very close to the end of the original contract amount. And they have just about 10 hours, had just about 10 hours remaining today when we had our meeting with them this morning. And there was some work done today. So we're very, very near the end. Um, the team of Common Street Outreach Workers continued to connect with the residents, both in person, by phone, by text, and by email, to maintain trust and build relationships and to better understand their needs, their concerns, their de and their desires for relocation, and to work on specific steps to aid their relocation as soon as possible. As I've learned more about the varied needs of the residents, as well as the horrible conditions of some of the rooms, I better understand why a general scope of work is important, as the city needs the flexibility to direct Common Street to move forward with service plans that are unique and tailored best for those residents, and for some of them to do it as quickly as possible, including today for one family that we were able to relocate. On a slightly different note, I also understand that we didn't know how quickly the purchase and sale would take place, nor the possession or use of the look of the hotel. And um, again, understanding the, the conditions of the, the motel, that if we did immediately become the owners of it, that to have a professional service agreement with property management services who could immediately step in to deal with the sanitation and the security and the utilities was was another reason that that was included in the scope of work um, so I very much request the approval of the contract amendment tonight if you don't we will be required to start all over seeking a new contractor which will take unnecessary time and with that the vulnerable residents will remain in unsanitary and unhealthy conditions that I fear will only get worse as the winter uh, approaches and it gets colder and as the tensions and uncertainty grows for those that are living there so that's all I have as far as my comments thank you questions or comments from council councilmember Ryan great thank you thanks for the update um, a few questions and then uh, maybe comments um, 
Julie, can you, uh, can you provide some clarification on how Common Street was chosen for the project? Um, yes, uh, our, I think I, I sent you an email to answer that question. Um, our outside counsel was Keenan Williams, and he's with the Foster Gravy firm, and he had been participating in condemnation law for 30 years. Um, he represented the city Port of Everett in the Kimberly Clark property condemnation and has represented cities like Bellingham and Arlington with respect to blighted motels. Kinnan re recommended Common Street as an experienced relocation firm that had the capacity to take on the work immediately. And staff had a conversation with Common Street that confirmed their availability and their experience. Um, because of this recommendation from our outside counsel, the relatively small size of the project with the number of residents being uh, are, units being around 11, well, we didn't know that at the time, but, and the need to get the work going. Staff did not uh, see the point, apparently, to interview additional firms. Instead, we were able to have the mayor sign a professional service agreement to get that work started immediately. And by and large, we have been very satisfied with Common Street. This is really hard work that they're going out and having to really handle delicate situations. And I see that they're not uh, engaging in, in any kind of um, political or, or any kind of work other than to try and help understand what is the best course of action for these residents and um, are really trying to make sure that their needs are met. Thank you. Um, I have a, some, uh, so the contract amendment before us is to increase the amount of con the contract to $260,000. <coughs> um, but I didn't see anywhere in the contract um, taking into account first last deposit, moving expenses, um, and other types of expenses that the city would be paying for to help with relocating people. Do we have an idea of what that amount is that's gonna be in addition to this contract? Really, we don't have an exact amount because it will be dependent on each of the individual situations, what their incomes are currently, where they wanna go, uh, how long it will take to find the place where they can relocate. Um, and so each and every situation is going to be different. Our immediate hope is to help the people that are living in units that are unsanitary and literally have feces in, in, in the rooms um, to be relocated even to a different hotel until we can work with them to find the right location. So it is going to be expensive and it may take time, but that's what we have signed up to do. So to be clear, the feces is from the plumbing not functioning correctly, right? Generally, there's, I, I know two different stories okay. about the feces that I'd be happy to tell you All at right. a different time. Another time, another time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then for ongoing monthly account management, it's my understanding that the city will be um, making up the difference between what folks can pay and what the uh, rental amount is for the next 40 months, if I remember correctly. But that requires like an ongoing monthly payment and reconciliation, who's gonna be responsible for that sort of account administration? Well, I'm certainly not the legal counsel, but the, the 40 months or the four years that we originally learned about what was related to the direct requirements of the Uniform Re uh, Recovery Act, the URA. And that is usually, that is not necessarily uh, applicable in all of the cases here. So um, that may not be the case that it will be 40 months. And so again, I. I can't speak exactly to um, that exact um, amount of time or money. And again, some of the individuals have adequate income. Some of them want different things that they don't want to have ongoing support. So every situation is a little bit different. So for the units that will have ongoing support, who's responsible for that account management? I would trust that our city would be responsible for that. Okay. Um, That sounds logistically difficult <laughs> to have invoices coming in, knowing the delta, sending money out. Um, it's like a whole right. accounts payable situation. Um, I'll, uh, I don't have any more questions, but I'll save my comments for later. Thanks. Councilmember Schwab. Yeah, and I know you've mentioned it before. Could you kind of recap, um, like, basically the quality insurance that we have for? Um, for this common street to make sure that they're the, they're doing their job and they're doing what our expectations are. I know you're talking about reports and uh, I, I know you have constant communication with them. 
but just a little bit of accountability with this organization if you could talk about I know you've mentioned it before but if well you um, could right now that. we're meeting with them on a, on a weekly basis with updates that they're providing verbally of, of what they're learning and about what the potential next steps are um, some of the information is um, private and and we don't want it to be disclosed and nor can it be disclosable um, due to a different deliberative process privilege that the RCW lists. Um, and so therefore, um, the initial uh, report that they provided to us was very general. And now the next uh, team that's been working on them has a lot more specifics about these individuals and what they need. So uh, aside from me, like sitting down and sharing with you the notes that I have that I believe all the entire council would be required um, to vote on that kind of information. And, and again, I'm not the legal experts to know I think what can be shared and when. Maybe to Councilmember Schwab's question, the, the accountability would be those weekly meetings with um, Julie and her <coughs> team to keep track of the work that Common Street is doing. Uh, and then there are some written reports, although, um, yeah. And that, I mean, that's just the beginning of it, but that's sort of how her staff and we'll have Julie <laughs> is managing that accountability that you asked about. Yeah, and I just to be clear, the, written, the reason that we don't have full, thorough written reports is because this is highly personal, confidential information that we don't want a public record of because it's their individual health care, behavior health needs that we wouldn't want. Um, we don't need those details. We just need to know how Common Street is helping the people get in a better situation. We also know that the, the situation's changing. Like sometimes the people are not interested in help and then the next time, you know, Common Street has shared that when they go out and talk to them, nope, we're not interested. And then they get a text that said, well, you know, actually I really appreciate that you brought us the blanket. I would be interested in talking to you. So there's a lot of changes in variables and information. Some of it misinformation that the clients are getting from a variety of sources, whether they're watching council meetings or talking to people that don't have correct information and so uh, it's a it's a evolving uh, process based on each individual situation yeah thank you and I'm not necessarily looking for in the in the weeds kind of <coughs> information but just the larger picture I just want the assurance that we're going to be success and and that the process to get there I just want to make sure that I, I know we all do that but uh, well, that's our full intention. I, yeah. I mean, is to try and work as quickly as possible to know what the people's needs are and to help them get to the end uh, relocation location. And, and in addition to that, basic needs, medical care, uh, other supports that, that these individuals may need. Thank you. Vice President Dewey. Oh, there we go. Um, Julia, I have just one quick question. So um, you kind of talked about moving as quickly as we can. I know it's it's probably hard to really define a timeline, but is do you have a uh, you know best scenario uh, timeline to have everyone relocated who's living there? You know, it's one of those situations where again each individual unit is different. So if an individual is ready today to fill out the application, or some of them said they were going to do it on their own, and then they realized, gosh, it's harder. I haven't filled out an application before. I don't have a computer. So Common Street is the one that is okay, I will come in, I will bring a hand copy to you. So once we get those application fees or applications filled out, then, then we get them a, a, a unit and then we pay the deposit and then we move, move them. So every one of those 11 units have different scenarios that we have to work through to get them to that place. And so, like I said, we moved one family today that was living in, in a very unsanitary location and we're experiencing some types of harassment and so we needed them to be in a safer location and so that happened today but we're still going to be working with them to find them permanency okay well thank you council member Zerlingo. i think it's worth noting we received an email today the council did uh, from a resident there who had been working with them had i'm trying to remember how it was stated uh, they'd identified a number of housing options that looked promising, 
they were encouraging us to vote forward on this because, of course, they're ready to take a next step. And now obviously, we need to authorize the expenditure if we want Common Street to be doing the next step. So that's, that's kind of where we are on this. And I guess it speaks a little bit to the time frame of this. I'm hoping a lot of these things will happen pretty quickly because clearly th this is a motel. It's not long-term housing. They don't have kitchens. And it sounds like even some of the basic services there really aren't in sanitary shape. So um, certainly in favor of proceeding forward. I'm going to just ask a question about the contract. I noticed the scope of work assumes a duration of six months of outreach. Does that include the time they've already done, or is this for the for six months from when the time that we sign this amendment? Time moving forward. OK. And then it says the budget assumes a four-month duration as the targeted timeline. So is that kind of what they notice is like the normal amount of time it takes? I think that's what they're anticipating and their hope is that they would be able to get in and help these individuals find relocation within that time frame. Okay. Thank Can you. I just share that um, when Common Street started, uh, they they took this a look at this and thought, okay, this is a simple relocation like in any other kind of motel or whatever. And then when they uh, went in and did their initial assessment, they realized that the folks were living in conditions must, much similar to an encampment and they had uh, issues much similar to people who were really experiencing chronic homelessness, not housed individuals. And so it has become a much more complicated uh, process. As we all know, when people have that level of trauma and behavioral health needs, uh, it takes a lot longer to get them stabilized. And so uh, they are uh, rolling up their sleeves, doing all they can to, to make that happen. And Julie's team of social workers is doing everything we can to uh, make that as quickly as possible. It's in our best interest for it to go quickly. Um, um, getting this contract uh, through tonight is very important because I uh, am quite concerned about the health and well-being of not only the people living there, but also the neighborhood surrounding. And there are, uh, it is becoming a more volatile situation there and would really urge the council to pass this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I can't smart for Vokley. Okay. Um, You, let's see, have the, in the agreement that we have right now, um, oh, I had all these other things written down, um, and now I've been surprised. And so, Common Street has been working since August, September. October, yes, August 23. Okay, just putting, I'm getting my story straight in my head so that I can hopefully be more coherent <coughs> than I was last week. Um, I'm going to get a word from the person who sent us an email earlier because I'm having a problem remembering the word. And that is <laughs> approval. <laughs> um, OK, so has Common Street been given the approval to um, pay money for deposits, um, receipts for folks that have had to clean up their messes and saved? Um, has any, because like that's, I know that that's, I haven't read that in any of the agreements that we've had, but um, but I've heard uh, from a few different people that part of the issue has been waiting for approval for funds. Well, I think there's a little bit of misinformation out there because the city doesn't own the building. The city is not responsible for the cleaning up or the 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 health and well-being of, of, the, of the facility. And so Common Street is not approving any payments for anything unless they come to the city and, and, and we say, yes, please do move forward with that. And what we're paying them to do is work with the individuals to help them on relocation services and apartment searching and moving expenses. And that's what our primary focus has been. And so, so far, 
we have only had one unit that has made has agreed to move forward with what Common Street has offered them. Have, and so let me just, I touched my nose, like you hit it on the nose there for a second, moving expenses. Has the city approved moving expenses for Common Street? Again, it would be based on each individual and so unit. did the city approve moving expenses for that unit that got relocated today? Today, our city staff moved the individuals. Our, our social workers in our van went to the motel and helped the people to move so we didn't have to incur any moving expenses for oh, them. Ah, okay, that is an answer. Um, do you want to take any questions <coughs> so I can gather something together? No? Yeah, like give any comment while I think for a minute. I don't want to go to the vote yet. Councilmember Fossey. So when we had tabled it, uh, I know we were looking at you guys setting up a meeting with Councilmember Vogley in the, in, during that week and kind of going over the contract stuff. Did that end up happening? We, we got questions via email, and so we responded via email. And, and oh. I, I mean, so I will just say that Councilmember Vogley at that meeting said a couple of times, or maybe, maybe once, I don't know, but has said she likes stuff in writing, and so I just thought, let's focus on that. Um, and so that's what we did. And we also got further information about what could be shared, and so then we were able to send her a, a document of the report that she wanted that had the redaction that was required by law. Yes, okay. we, were, we were thinking about setting up a meeting and then we found a way to get it, you know, via get email her paper. It, it seemed more efficient and it was late in the day anyways, so yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for taking that moment. Um, I did get that information and yes, it was redacted and that's fine. Um, It would, I guess my concern and the concerns that I've heard from people that live there, um, and it's more than one, and one has said that I have permission to relay some information. And essentially, um, Common Street came in, and I think we've talked about this a couple of times, once or twice, twice in September, and there was a total of three different people from Common Street. First day, it was, you know what, I don't know, I wasn't there, but there was definitely two visits, two people from Common Street. And they asked questions, and you had given me a copy of the survey that I had asked for. And, you know, on that was like phone number and email and all of the obvious stuff that somebody asks another person that they're gonna help relocate or just, you know, go into business with. Um, and then they didn't hear a, from Common Street again until November 11th. And um, this particular person, <laughs> this particular person noticed that it was a federal holiday. Um, when a third person, Trisha, who has been mentioned, um, came and, and then asked the same questions again of, and, and, and the resident um, was like, you already have our information, don't you have, you know, we've given this to you. And, oh yeah, yeah, it's at the office, it's at the office, but here, you know, let me, let me just get it again. And the feeling from that um, whole engagement was one of a lack of professionalism. And that is what I have heard from multiple residents from Common Street. Um, and so when I hear even from tonight who is the person um, as I've mentioned in previous correspondence, I'm currently a resident of the Waits Motel and I'm awaiting relocation. I've been in communication with Trisha 
Munson of Common Street regarding relocation, and it has been a helpful and hopeful process over these last couple of weeks. She has informed me that they are awaiting funding approval before we can proceed with housing applications. We've already found a number of housing options that look promising, and I am eager to move forward with this process. Um, I have received emails from this person before, and it's only been the last couple of weeks that she feels hopeful. And so my issue with um, continuing with Common Street is they have appeared to have a serious lack of professionalism um, and a not a, and an overall ununderstanding of what is acceptable for them to do, um, like look for apartments and um, and considering that on October 9th, their initial report was given uh, to the city. Um, that had a lot of information. I don't know what it was, <laughs> but there was a lot of black lines look kind of like something else we've talked about in the past. Um, so even though things are hopeful and things are moving along, wonderfully these past two weeks, um, I'm still <coughs> not hearing that there's been a possible approval of funds. You know, I don't, I can't tell if she means they're awaiting funding of this ordinance to be passed, not ordinance, I'm sorry, this amendment um, to be approved, um, or if Common Street is wondering and I've read some emails that would appear that it would be that Common Street is waiting for approval from the city to give the money. It's really hard for me to not talk about people's specific situations in this scenario. And so you are absolutely correct that Common Street went out in September and then we got a very initial report from them that you received that was redacted. And in that report, it was very general information about, yes, these people need assistance with relocation. They will, some people may need help moving. Some people have medical issues. It was very general. Then when they went back out, starting on November 11th, Tricia having kind of that background of working in encampments and working with relocation of people that higher, have higher level of needs, not just a person that whose house is being moved because they're building a bridge, but who actually have medical, social service, academic, I mean, just a lot of challenges, poverty. So Trisha started to re-establish re relationships and tried to use kind of the initial uh, information to then gather more information. And each week or each time that she talks to them, she learns more information about them. And the people that you're talking about that you got the email from, just today, they actually said, we do, we do want your help, we do want that information. And so, yes, Tricia, you can work with our social worker and use our purchasing card to pay for their application. So that is the kind of nuanced work that we are doing with Common Street, and they have the relationship, they have the time. I don't have a whole staff team that can go out and have the expertise to work with people to understand how to do all of these things in regards to relocation. And so, and then, you know, I think that Again, I know that you've talked to somebody else, and that other person sometimes is very interested in working with Trisha, and then other times doesn't, isn't available. So everybody has different needs and different options, and may or may not want to engage on that specific day, but also is very willing at times to send texts. So there's a lot of a lot of nuances to each of these scenarios. I guess. Um yeah, that makes total sense. I just want, that makes total sense. Um, according to the PSA, original one, and the new one, um, it would seem that a lot of the work has been done and paid for um, already, um, which is what I've found from the invoices and the 
information gathered and I'm there's like the intellectual property clause I don't know number six or five or something that says the work that's been done by a body can then be it's owned by the city so if we chose another group of people that are local and not Tacoma, Chehalis, Bellingham, rural America, um, that inf the trust, if there's trust, that, that would be starting all over again, absolutely, because trust only comes through experience. Um, but that information could then be given to a new provider of advisory services. Um, I would I would just kind of contend that you've talked a lot about people being traumatized in this situation and by pulling Common Street at this point and the only person that they have the primary relationship with and then bringing in someone else to have to start all over again will only put a further wedge and will make it so it will be more difficult for them to, to determine a better plan for themselves. It would also take an excessive amount of time. Every time we start and stop a contract, unfortunately, as we've all discovered, the city moves incredibly slowly at most of the time. There's very few times that I can say, okay, let's call an emergency <coughs> ordinance and get some pallets up right away. But that's not the way government operates. We are slow. And for us to not use Commons, right, not just make an amendment to this contract, but say, hey, let's go get a new person. Even if we have a brand, like a great contractor in the works, it's gonna take us, I don't know, a month to get a new contract passed through legal approved and then back in front of this body to begin the work and that is a whole month where people are living in feces and we have the trauma that is going on in the units and around the neighborhood so again i just have to urge you whether you like this contract or not i'm sorry i'd love for you to pass it because i'd like to help these people yeah now that's that's understandable um it really is and I know that everybody wants me to be done now, but I'm not. <sighs> Unless I am. Um, I just want on record, and everybody's heard me say it a gazillion times, they need to do their job <laughs> and do it well, and maybe now they are because I do not believe that they were. And the residents there, no matter what type of trauma they're in, they have suffered more because of the lack of movement that could have been activated regardless of the legal proceedings of condemnation and um, purchase and sale agreements and all of those things. We, as a governing body, helped with some of that trauma. And I do not want us to be the governing body that continues causing trauma. Well then, Liz, you might as well pass the amendment. Yeah, I get it. And it probably will pass. But they're on notice. <laughs> And I have no power over like controlling them, but people need to know. And I think that they may have heard that they need to get, continue working as they have the past couple of months. Councilmember Ryan. Thank you. Uh, this last week I reached out to some of my contacts with the, in the <coughs> affordable housing world and they were able to um, connect me and network me with some other local groups that also provide relocation services. So my frustration is that Common Street wasn't, was the only option on the table and that we didn't use our vast network to look for other groups that are local, that know our local services providers, that know the local landscape, and that could uh, provide services to these people in the same or better way for a better cost. I was shocked at the original contract for $45,000 only then to see that this one's to the $260,000. I don't think any of us 
knew what we were getting into and what we were stepping into with these relocation services, and we certainly didn't know it would be to the tune of $260,000. With 11 occupied units, it's $23,000 per unit, not including these additional costs with first last deposits, moving expenses, and everything else moving forward. And, um, and from what we've been hearing, um, that money could be better spent to help these folks instead of continuing to uh, disrupt their lives, even with the uh, squalor that's happening in their spaces. Um, with this, the award of this contract, sidestepping the, an RFP <coughs> process, the amendment that quintuples the contract amount, and the exorbitant hourly rates that people are making, I see this as a blatant contribution to the poverty industrial complex, and I will not be supporting this moving forward. I think this is a huge lesson learned for many of us, and I would urge folks that if this situation does come up again, that we have, um, we tap into our networks to touch with the folks that we know do work in this community, with populations like this uh, to get a better idea of how uh, we can best serve them. Thanks. May I just add, just to, I know that it doesn't make anything better, but it's a not to exceed amount. So the goal is it's not, you know, they could get it done really quickly and maybe not get anywhere near, near the full amount of the contract. So it doesn't mean it's going to be $260,000. It's not to exceed amount. So I just Is it to possible that. then to have it just be uh, 100,000 if they're making great strides up to 45,000, then maybe we don't. Then we're going to come back and have this exact same process. I mean, right? So I. Vice President Dewey. Yeah, I just uh, want to comment on Councilman Ryan's last comments. And I think they're a very good lesson learned for moving forward. Uh, I hate to postpone this anymore for these folks. I think we need to move as quickly as possible as we can. Um, but I also think that the point that she brought up um, are very valid, and I would not like to see it happen again like that. So, Councilmember Vogley. It could be moved forward expeditiously with a new under 50,000. PSA like we did with the first one and uh, so that is a possibility <coughs> for another group. A council member Schwab. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I too thank you um, council member Ryan for bringing up those issues. Um, in the end, uh, we want success. And so um, I'm just hoping that as we go through this process that there'll be some, some sort of <coughs> report at the end, not in the weeds, but overall report and things that we've learned and things that we did, things that we did right, things that we could improve on. So I hope that's going to be part of this process. Not that I'm looking to condemn another building, but we may be, <laughs> we may be in a process where we might have to re, you know, Nash, uh, disaster, it's an old earthquake, lots of different things that could happen. I'd certainly like to make sure that that process of finding homes for people is, is improved. To be sure. Councilmember Vogley. I am afraid of moving people to other motels because of our recent emergency and our next emergency amendment. And what? I'm afraid of feth and ment. Feth and mentinal? <laughs> Fentanyl and meth <laughs> um, being in walls and ceilings and carpets of other motels, so. And I, can I have a brief comment? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Just right. that um, this kind of professional services agreement does not require an RFP or bid through the procurement policy or through state law, just in case, I'm sure council's aware of that, but just so that members of the public aren't confused. One wasn't required, so one wasn't done. Mm -hmm. And that's for almost all types of PSAs, except for some type of engineer but I can't remember which type of yeah. engineer, but certainly not in this case. Right. <laughs> and uh, because we've never done this before, we followed outside legal counsel's advice. And yes, of course, we can learn lessons learned and we'll document that. And hopefully we don't have to go through this again, but it's good to keep that for future reference. Yes. I really like how you mentioned he has 30 years of experience or more. And he's written the book on all of this. So he knows what's going on. 
Thank you. Any last comments? Uh, Clerk, we please call the roll. Vice President Tui? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? No. Councilmember Vogley? No. Councilmember Schwab? Yes. Councilmember Fossey? Yes. Councilmember Zarlingo? Yes. President Stone Cipher? Yes. We move on to item 21, Council Bill 2312 74. First, second, and third readings adopt an emergency ordinance relating to temporary uses. Adopting an interim official control allowing temporary uses under EMC 19.05.068 to be renewed, declaring an emergency, and setting a public hearing date. And the public hearing will be on December 20th. Um, and thank you. Although the public hearing is not uh, taking place until the 20th, we can still take public comment tonight. Angie, do we have anyone signed up to speak on this? Or oh, I'm sorry. Good evening. <laughs> I'm not letting our uh, planning director do his job first. And I didn't Slate even, York. I didn't even sign up, yes. Uh, I'll go briefly through this. Uh, in October, unfortunately, contamination was discovered at Claire's Place Supportive Housing uh, facility at 6200 12th Drive Southeast that made the apartments unsafe or at least potentially unsafe for habitation. To provide safe accommodation for the residents, uh, city staff worked with the provider of Claire's Place to stand up over a weekend and a few days, 30 outdoor emergency shelters on adjacent city-owned land using a temporary use provision in EMC 1905068. The temporary use permit, which I issued on October 16th, was necessary because outdoor shelters were otherwise prohibited in the R1 zone in which both Claire's Place and the adjacent uh, city-owned reservoir land were located. The remediation is still ongoing, although it's in its final phases and I think should be wrapping up here in a couple of weeks, but the temporary use permit that was issued on October 16th runs out on December 15th. So we have a timing issue here. Mm -hmm. Under uh, 1905-068, temporary uses are limited to 60 days and only once per 365-day period. So no renewals and no extensions are permitted under city code. So I'm here today with an emergency ordinance that would remove the limit of once per year for temporary use uh, permits. Uh, all the other provisions in that section would remain. The ordinance would also clarify that a temporary use permit is a review one process decision. And to be clear, that is not a change. That is only a clarification to be crystal clear in code. Uh, if the ordinance passes, I would issue a renewed temporary use permit for the uh, pallet shelters on adjacent to Claire's place. The ordinance itself is temporary with an automatic repeal in six months. During that time, the Planning Commission would review the provisions in the ordinance and then provide a recommendation back to you uh, on whether to let the, uh, these changes expire as directed in the ordinance, uh, keep them or something else. Because this is an emergency ordinance, the formal public hearing uh, has to happen after the action is requested. As you said, Council President, uh, we would be happy to take public comment today as well, but we need 19 days uh, before a council meeting for proper public notice, four days to get to the Herald, and 15 days before the meeting is when that notice needs to happen. So we have uh, a formal public hearing scheduled on December 20th. Um, but again, happy to take any comments if anybody's here for that today. I have three housekeeping amendments to the proposed ordinance. That's the sheets that I handed to you. If you could hand those oh, down sorry. the line. I'll, okay. I'll read them out, but uh, just again, because it's getting late here. Uh, in section three, we should add the words and shall be effective immediately upon becoming valid. In section four, it's a correction. It's sections one and two that will be repealed six months from effective date. And then in section five, we can fill in that the public he hearing date would be December 20th. Okay. Happy to take any questions. Any questions or, or comments for uh, Councilmember Oakley? I think I just heard you. Okay, I'm just going to ask the question because I think you answered it, but now I'm not so sure. Oh gosh. Uh, will it be a permanent change? Like for if if the emergency ordinance passes and they and then it happens. Uh, will it forever be on the books until we change it again? No, it would automatically repeal in six months. So for six months, 
temporary use permits would be renewable. These don't come up very often. We have nothing else in the works and wouldn't expect to use it during that time. Uh, but with no further action, it would uh, repeal automatically in six months. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Do we have anyone signed up to speak? No, we do not. Okay. Um, and so I don't think we, let's let me look at what we're doing here. I guess that's all we have. We have, uh, we will see you back on the 20th. No, if we could have uh, amendment and action tonight. Oh, thank uh, you. To make this effective. Thank you, so thank the you three amendments present. add the words and shall be effective immediately yep. upon becoming valid. Uh, fix the section numbers to one and two and fill in the hearing date Indeed. of December yes. 20. Do I hear a motion to approve these amendments? So moved. Second with a question. Okay. Question. When does it become valid? Upon the mayor's signature, which hopefully will be relatively soon. So it would be immediate. I guess I'm a little bit confused because we're voting tonight. There's a public hearing on the 20th. I thought that it was valid, like, we'll vote on it tonight, yes? Uh, correct. So we vote on it tonight. It's an, structured as an emergency ordinance under the charter, and there's a provision in state law that requires that if a public hearing is not able to be held before action, it has to be held retroactively. It's after right. the action is taken okay. and the ordinance is effective, but the public still gets the... Tutor. And it's happening here, not at the... Um at Tuesday the public night hearing, meetings. yeah, the public hearing would just be an opportunity to hear from the public about what okay. you have well, already we are, done. Well, we already did. Got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, clarification, and then if there's written comments, or we'll get notified. Is that this yes. body will? All right. Thanks. Yep. Okay, so first we'll uh, we have a motion and a second on the table to approve the amendments. Let's take uh, the roll on that. Clerk, will you please call the roll. Vice President Tui? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? Yes. Councilmember Vogley? Yes. Councilmember Schwab? Yes. Councilmember Fossey? Yes. Councilmember Zarlingo? Yes. President Stone Cipher? Yes. And now we will take, I will entertain a motion to adopt the emergency ordinance. So move to adopt the ordinance. As amended. As amended. Second. Any questions or comments? Councilmember Zarlingo? Uh, just a quick one. Thanks for anticipating the kind of questions that uh, we talked about earlier in this change of ordinance and uh, that very well explained something that's odd, but, but again, you anticipated all our questions. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Clerk, call the roll. Vice President Tui? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? Yes. Councilmember Vogley? Yes. Councilmember Schwab? Yes. Councilmember Fossey? Yes. Councilmember Zarlingo? Yes. President Stone Cipher? Yes. Thank you. And now we have the continued public hearing for the 2024 budget, which we will now open. <coughs> and I saw Susie Haugen and Heidi Berlantes sneak in. Hopefully you were out enjoying some dinner or something while you waited for us to get through the earlier part of our agenda. <laughs> sure. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, I do not have any further presentations for this evening. Uh, we're certainly here to answer any questions. I think we did want to make a quick comment uh, regarding Council or Vice President uh, Tui's request. And uh, I believe we mentioned earlier uh, as we were going through the briefings that we did not budget originally in 2024 for the approved COVID programs or COVID recovery programs. Um, the reason for that is, is that we want to be able for clarity, we want to be able to wait till the end of the year, see what has actually been spent out of the approved programs and then reappropriate the amount that's left so that we'll have some certainty there. So based on that, um, I would propose and recommend that when we uh, get to budget amendment number one next year, that we bring back uh, Vice President Tui's suggestion for some modification of, uh, to allow an additional um, allocation for the council um, allocation of those funds. Councilmember Schwab. Yeah, good. Thank you for that. Um, I just have a question. Do you have any updated um, projections on the uh, sales tax revenue? Anything different than what you've presented? Uh, it keeps coming in a little bit more strongly. Um, I expect it will end the year at about $39 million. Mm, thank you. It's been an uh, incredibly outstanding year in terms of sales tax. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Council Member Zerling. A question about those funds, because I have not, uh, I have some initial ideas about spending those, but I guess I, I want to make sure that I'm not violating any um, expiration dates on these funds, because it's taken me longer than I'd hoped to identify the best way to spend those. So any unspent funds from this year's uh, council projects allocation from the COVID recovery will be proposed in the budget amendment number one of next year as a reappropriation. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilmember Ryan. Sure, I guess while we're talking about that. Um, in possibly in conjunction, maybe it's already going to be happening with uh, budget amendment number one next year, I would request just a overview of the COVID recovery dollars and mm -hmm. what has been allocated and um, where some stalls are, um, what's available. So just an update on that I think would be really helpful. Um, and I would love to hear, not necessarily right now, but at some point from council members on, we have heard some updates on projects that have mm -hmm. been chosen and uh, organizations and I don't know if there's a way to uh, get a more comprehensive list of that or yeah, where I mean, everybody's at, that'd be we great. We could put that on our agenda and maybe let each council member explain who, what, where, why they chose what they did. Um, so let me talk, uh, work with administration to see if that can come on the 14th or the 20th. I'm not sure <coughs> which agenda has more time on it. Good idea. Any other questions? Okay, do we have anyone uh, signed up in the public to speak, Angie? No, we do not. Okay. Uh, do I hear a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Seconded. Thank you. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Vice President Tui? Yes. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Vogley? Yes. Aye. Yes. <laughs> Council Member Schwab, yes. Council Member Schwab. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Zerlingo? Yes. President Stonecipher? Yes. And so I will read the, the uh, Council Bill 2310 55, third and final reading. Adopt an ordinance appropriating the budget for the City of Everett for the year 2024 in the amount of $746,730,743. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any final questions or comments? Councilmember Ryan. Uh, just a comment. I um, wanted to thank Mayor Franklin for her comments earlier about the importance of looking at revenue options next year. I think, um, as we had heard, uh, Councilmember Zarlingo mentioned the pipe that's 125 years old. There's a lot of projects mm -hmm. in the city mm -hmm. that are about 100 years old from when the uh, city was first starting to uh, get infrastructure of that type. and. Uh, we hear all the time from constituents with um, frustrations that they have with the city and um, I do my best to share, you know, if we had a levy lid lift and more revenue to address these types of things, then uh, we would be better able to serve our constituents. So I'm hopeful that those discussions start earlier, in the earliest is in January as uh, staff can get, uh, can get to it um, because uh, I think if we do plan to put it on next November's ballot, that's going to come a lot sooner than mm -hmm. we're expecting. And there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle and uh, ducks that need to be in a row to get to that point. So um, a lot of outreach, a lot of engagement. I encourage fellow council members as well uh, at community meetings and neighborhood associations to talk about this and the importance of um, and just helping to get the word out so voters aren't surprised or neighborhoods aren't surprised and so that people are informed so that they can um, hopefully be supportive as well. So, uh, Susie and staff, thank you. Susie, Heidi, and everybody, thank you so much for your hard work. It was, um, appreciate all, all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to also thank you, Susie and Heidi, for all your work. I know there's other people behind the scenes that do that. Um, and I also wanted to comment on the process this year where we had the budget committee held mostly at council meetings, not a, a couple special meetings, but I felt like that was a good process and something that the council may want to consider continuing. Um, particularly when we have, you know, it's so complicated and so many different moving parts that it's nice for everyone to get the information at the same time. Any final comments before we call the roll? Clerk, please take the roll. Vice President Tui? Yes. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Vogel? Aye. Council Member Schwab? Yes. Council Member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Zarlingo? Yes. President John Cipher? Yes. Those eyes are messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will move on to um, Council Bill 2311-64, first reading. 
this the right one? No. Nope, I'm, I'm missing one. As, as you um, get oriented there, Council President Stonecipher, we, we have um, four briefings left, and um, she's too far away for me to mention it to um, our city attorney tonight, but I'm kind of hoping that 25 and 26 briefings might be pushed um, to second reading. Um, and just due to the hour yes. of the evening. I, second. Um, I do know we have to, um, it's important that we do the briefing on animal control because that is an ordinance that has a sunset clause, so. Yes, um, okay, we will yeah. do the briefing on that. I will read the correct uh, Council Bill 2310-56, third and final reading. So I probably messed with you there. It's 2311-72 that you're looking for, um, the 2023 budget. Uh, Thank you. 2311-72, first and second reading, adopt an ordinance approving the appropriations of the 2023 revised City of Everett budget and amending ordinance number 3970-23. And the third and final reading on this will be next week. Um, so, welcome again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so this is our last budget amendment of the year. And, uh, Happy to be here tonight presenting it to you. Uh, it's been a it's been an eventful year and uh, a lot going on in in our area. Uh, in total, we're proposing to amend the budget by twelve point one million dollars, which includes four point six million for the general government and seven point five million for non general government funds. We begin general government amendments with $1.5 million increase to the jail fee expenditure budget. Both the number of inmates and number of housing days are driving jail costs upward. The number of inmates through October are up 61% over the same period in 2022, and the number of housing days are up by 28%. The original budget this year for jail fees was $3,045,000, and this amendment will increase it to $4,545,000. Next, we have an amendment proposing to increase the general government fund self-insurance contributions by $1.2 million to cover rising costs associated with uh, property insurance premiums and substantial increases in workers' compensation and tort claim settlements. We're also proposing to an increase to non-general government fund contributions, which will be later in this uh, presentation. The next three amendments are related to Governmental Accounting Standards Board or the GASB reporting requirements. First, we have an amendment to increase the state's left to special funding contributions by 58,200. The state actually pays 3.4% of the city's annual left to retirement costs. The 2023 contributions are exceeding the original budget due to higher salaries. Next, we have a $65,000 amendment to account for the implementation of GASB Statement Number 96, which relates to subscri subscription-based information technology arrangements, or what we are calling SPEDAs. Uh, these Contracts that meet the long-term definition of a speeder require accounting entries to record capital outlay expenditures. The city's contract management system is an example of a speeder that meets that long-term uh, definition and requires a capital outlay entry. And the last accounting standard proposed amendment is for $116,000 to account for capital outlay expenditures associated with new leases as required by GASB Statement Number 87. There is a similar amendment in non-general government funds expenditures for new leases, which you will see in a subsequent request. And while these entries do not impact cash, uh, the amendments are still necessary to provide the budget authority to record the transactions in accordance with governmental accounting reporting requirements. The last amendment on this slide proposes to add $20,000 to the demolition and abatement expenditure budget. The 23 original budget includes $100,000 in the non-departmental department 009. However, the city's code compliance division uh, needs additional funding to cover increased costs associated with graffiti abatement 
and removal of property related to public health and safety nuisances. We're requesting an additional funding in the amount of 176,000 for interfund labor, labor reimbursements. This amendment will increase facilities and property management's budget to reimburse Everett Transit for custodial labor spent working on city buildings other than the trans transit buildings. We have an increase in the library's budget to reimburse Everett Transit for loaned security officer staffing at the Everett Public Libraries. We have an increase in information technology's budget to reimburse the water and sewer utility for staff time spent on citywide cybersecurity initiatives. We have an increase to municipal arts to reimburse parks for staffing sort of culture and the 4th of July events. And finally, we will be increasing parks labor budget. The cost is the, the cost of this increase will be offset by reimbursements from transit for services parks provided transit. Uh, we are seeking funding approval to add a judicial assistant to municipal court for the implementation of the automated traffic safety camera program. That amount, the amount proposed in the amendment represents two months of compensation plus one time startup costs. This position is not yet funded in the proposed 2024 budget, so we'll be requesting a permanent addition in the uh, first of budget amendment of next year. We're also seeking funding approval to add a community support manager to community development. The new position will help manage the additional staff, work with mental health professionals, case managers, and community support team members, and represent the city in local, state, and federal programs and initiatives that further the city's behavioral health response. The labor costs are supported by a grant received from AWC in the amount of $58,000. This amendment will create the budget authority to move funding from General Government Special Projects Fund 155, where the grant is accounted for, to the General Fund labor for labor costs. Um, this position does not yet exist in the proposed 2024 budget, so this is another one that we'll be bringing back in budget amendment number one for uh, to uh, further the funding for it. Additional support is needed to complete the upgrade of the city's financial system and the implementation of the two governmental accounting standards that I mentioned previously. This amendment will provide funding to bring back a recent retiree on a part-time basis as uh, an administrative day laborer to assist us with these projects. We're proposing to increase the fire department's expenditure budget by $759,000 for costs associated with staff turnover. There's been a large number of separations in the fire department in the last two years. Some positions were hired in advance of retirements due to the length of time required to train and deploy new recruits. This request will cover the excess costs associated with advanced hiring, uh, ac academy instructors and company officers, uniforms and protective clothing, and registration. Uh, Susie, can I just add that that is also uh, a mechanism that we're using to hopefully reduce overtime over the course of the year. We, we try a number of things. Fire overtime has been a challenge for very many years uh, here at the city, as you all know. Uh, but. Uh, working with our fire chief and uh, union, one of the goals is to hire early so that hopefully we have more team members available when we do need to call people in. So thank you. The next amendment proposes to increase administration and human resource department's labor budget by $69,850 for three employee retirement and separation payouts. Emergency management is requesting to add one part-time day laborer for six months to assist with a variety of projects, such as inventory, training plans, and a volunteer program. We'll request a reappropriation in the first budget amendment of next year for any unspent funds. Next, we have a request to increase emergency management's budget for grant-related expenditures and additional funding for vehicle fuel repairs and maintenance. 
The police department received an additional $2,500 in federal financial boating program grant funds to provide 40 hours of instructor services for basic marine law enforcement training. This amendment proposes to increase the expenditure budget for those grant funds. The last amendment on this slide, it proposes to increase the fire department's expenditure budget by $15,000 to equip each fire engine with speed swivels. Due to vandalism of firefighting water connections in downtown commercial buildings, it's necessary to outfit fire engines with speed swivels to ensure the department can respond to fires regardless of the condition of the building connections. We have two additional amendments for the fire department, including $69,000 for emergency repairs to fire apparatus and $94,000 for fuel due to inflation. The court is mandated to have interpreters present at court hearings for limited English speaking individuals that have been charged with a crime. Actual costs for interpreters have exceeded original budget expectations this year. The court is requesting an additional $20,000 to compensate interpreters for the remainder of the year. The next amendment will increase the parks budget by $91,000 for the Jetty Island Days program and ferry services. The city obtained lodging tax grants from both the City of Everett's program and Snohomish County and entered into a partnership with the Port of Everett to cover most of the expenditures associated with Jetty Island. Engineering and Public Services budgeted $7,500 in 2023 for reimbursements for claims arising from vehicle collisions with city-owned properties such as street lights and uh, traffic signals. There were several incidents this year that caused damage to the city's infrastructure and we are proposing uh, to increase their budget by $142,000 for supplies and equipment which will be offset by insurance claim revenue. Um, and at this point, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Heidi to uh, do the non-general government funds, but I'll pause to take a question from Council Member Vogley. Thanks. I thought it was question time, so I was like, ah! Mm -hmm. um, the very first one, and that is jail budget expenditures. Mm -hmm. And the question is... Um, does the uptick happen to be in conjunction with the um, open public use ordinance that we put in place? I can't remember the month right now, but it was the same as sodas. So I don't know if you know that, but it may be the our legal department. Well, I would, I would comment part of that is that the jail costs have been rising since uh, COVID has uh, not been such an intense issue. So beginning, I would say, in 21, <coughs> 2020, jail, the bottom dropped out of jail fees, and, and they were a fraction, quite frankly, of what they had been in 2019. And uh, there were a number of reasons for that. One was the pandemic, and I, I just, there just wasn't as much activity out there, I assume, but there was also a lot of legislation that impacted that, and that impacted when the courts could issue warrants, and um, I think that probably Flora could speak to this much more eloquently than I could, but there were, uh, there were a few other legislative actions that curtailed uh, the booking of individuals into jail. So this has been on a rise since 2021. Um, it continues to go up. I can't really comment whether or not any of the last few months have been related to that most recent uh, ordinance that you passed, but I think I would just defer to Flora on that. Sure. Um, part of the reason why there was a lower jail bill during COVID was because the Washington State Supreme Court entered emergency orders, which made it more difficult for judges to issue warrants for people, which is usually when people don't show up to court, a warrant issues, and then they get booked into jail to make them show up to court. Um, and so 
a lot of cases weren't able to have warrants for a long time because of the Washington State Supreme Court's emergency orders during COVID. Uh, so that's no longer in effect, and now it's business as usual. Um, the open public use of controlled substances crime, that automatically went into effect in Everett because we had adopted the RCW by reference back when the state legislature turned um, possession of a controlled substance from a felony into a misdemeanor, we adopted the RCW by reference back then so that when they made those changes this year in July, or effective in July, it automatically went into effect then in our municipal code. Um, and not all of the people who end up in jail medical uh, detoxing are actually charged with a controlled substance crime. Sometimes they're charged with other crimes but they're still detoxing from controlled substances. And a lot of our medical costs from the jail are from people who are too sick. They don't wanna to come to court, you know, the very next day after they've been booked into jail and they're in jail medical, um, getting medical care, which is more expensive for us. Um, so a lot of it is people who are detoxing from controlled substances who are in the jail on Everett municipal court charges. A lot of them are drug charges. Not all of them are drug charges though, because people can still use drugs even if they haven't been caught using them in public. Thank you, that yeah. was informative, I appreciate it. Yeah. Councilmember Schwab. Yeah, <clears throat> I had a question, something that the mayor had brought up earlier, which I really appreciate and that was uh, working with the overtime dollars there in the fire department. I'm assuming that some of the dollars might be recovered from the reduction in overtime costs. I mean, that's the idea. It's a, it's a, it's a removing ball, I know, but. We won't see that recovery for uh, some time. Right. But that would be the hope. Yep, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Councilmember Ryan. Uh, two questions, um, or two topics, probably more than two questions. Um, I'm curious how the city can award ourselves LTAC dollars for Jetty Island days. Well, uh, we have an LTAC committee uh, that reviews all the proposals and historically the city has applied just like any other entity because the city also hosts uh, events that put heads in beds uh, and which is kind of the goal of LTAC. And um, so the LTAC committee is staffed by a couple council member or a council member and then uh, representatives from hotels and motels. This year, I believe uh, because it's kind of weird that we are submitting proposals and everyone else. I think uh, Tyler is working with uh, the committee to do something differently and I'm, you can yeah, probably speak yeah, to that better. Yeah, as the chair of the LTAC committee, we, um, the city has always been kind of in the competitive process, which is a little awkward because, but I mean, we obviously qualify and have good um, numbers because our events are as good as a concert and we're doing a lot of those. Um, so what we have decided for this year, but it kind of is hard for the arts groups to see the city competing against them um, for those funds. So what we're looking at doing this year is having kind of a set aside of funds for the city events that we do. Uh, there will be like a fixed amount that city, the city will get. It's kind of actually going to be a little bit less than what we've been taking for those events. Um, we already do take an allocation for our tourism funding program. And then we'll leave the rest of the money that will only be competitive with the arts, with the other nonprofits that are competing for funds through that program. So we're doing it a little differently, and it's actually more in line with what a lot of other communities do with the funding. The city takes a portion for the things they do, and then they're like visibly, visibly, visibly competing <laughs> for um, funding because it doesn't feel good for some of those arts groups to think, well, the big cities, you know got a grant in too and I'm not going to get as much funding because they're going to get theirs. Great. Thank you. Um, and then I also had a question about, or a few questions I guess, about the jail fee increase. Um, and I'll probably have to go back, I'm so tired, i probably have to go back and re-listen to Flora's explanation, but, and I'm not sure if I can, I'll do my best to phrase this, but my curiosity is um, if there's been an increase in the ratio of uh, police interaction with uh, indiv indiv with suspects um, or if that ratio is the same there's just more bookings now if that makes sense does that make sense like our mm. I mean, if, if I'm seeing a uh, chief Drew get up I wasn't necessarily ask, asking for an answer right now but if you got it go for it That's a lot of pressure. I just want to make sure I understand your question. Mm -hmm. Are you saying is the increase in jail fees because we're contacting more suspects today than we were like last year? Basically, my curiosity is if we're 
we're still having the same number of touch points with uh, people in the community, but there's just more arrests that are happening bec um, because of changes in laws or changes in policies or procedures. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to comment on if there's just more contacts, more more touches, more exposure to people. I would say that uh, as we've looked backwards the last few years, that our officers and everything that's happened over the last few years, COVID, um, police reform, lots of lots of changes in the law, uncertainty within law enforcement because the law was changing so much, that I think our officers are getting more and more comfortable getting out of their cars, which is a measurement of the health of a police organization. And what happens sometimes, like we talked earlier about increased patrols around um, Jackson Park, that may mean we contact some people, which may mean we run into a warrant, for example, which may mean somebody gets booked into jail. Um, I think we're still below our, our pre-2020 jail uh, budget. So it's very high, and then the number looks very big, but it's still even lower than before we entered into COVID. So uh, that's a long way of saying I don't know the total answer to that, except that I know our officers are contacting more people today than there were even at the beginning of the year. Yeah, I think another way that I could have phrased it was if um, if there if more contacts are leading to arrest mm -hmm. than they had previously. That that I'm not a hundred percent sure, but um, you know we're trying to deal with a, a, a fentanyl and meth crisis where sometimes a booking is not only good for the moment, but also maybe the only exposure some of these people will have to to detox and then the jail does offer some services that may help with that depending on how long they're in there. So there's lots of reasons why an officer might make an arrest, but I'm not sure I can say uh, with full confidence if we're seeing a higher percentage of contacts turning into arrests now. I'm not sure about that. Thanks. Yes, I can speak to it a little bit. Uh, so Everett was lucky because um, for a little bit of time, there was a bit of a vacuum uh, before July this year when the state legislature put back into put into effect the public use of a controlled substance. Uh, that wasn't a crime before, but Everett has our local drug loitering ordinance. So it was a crime to use drugs in public in Everett for that year of time when elsewhere in the state, if you were outside the municipality of Everett and not in a municipality that had its own drug loitering ordinance, uh, you might not be arrested for using drugs in public. And so we didn't have a huge spike because we had already been arresting, or our officers had already been arresting people, prosecutors already charging people for drug loitering for what is now being charged for public use of a controlled substance. Um, we did have some increase because the possession of a controlled substance went from being a three strikes misdemeanor where they wouldn't get charged for it until the third time they were caught to they get charged for it right away and it's a gross misdemeanor, meaning punishable by up to a year in jail the first time they're caught. And so there has been some increase. Again, it's just since July um, and it's about 36 cases a month net if we're looking at just those crimes by themselves not associated with being arrested for another crime like assault and then you're caught with drugs on you. So standalone, it's still, it is an increase, a net increase of uh, about 36 a month. And that was as of November when we looked at our numbers for that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, what's our jail budget for 2024, even though we just approved that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can get it to me like tomorrow or after several cups of coffee tomorrow. I think it's about 4.5 million. So, which is, exact amount equal to what this amendment would add to our 2023 allocation for yeah taxes. so so um four so yeah it's about 4.4 so it's just slightly less we're, we're ending the budget with this year so you know i think it is entirely possible that we'll have to revisit this next year in one of the budget amendments um you know, again, we, we put this budget together in the summer. Uh, generally, in, we're doing this particular work in July, and the jail bills have continued to outpace every month uh, what the budget was for 2023. So yeah, um, I, th I think it's highly likely um, that we will be back again. Yeah, I, I mean, I see it as inevitable if the... Um the ordinance that's going to be talked about next week about um, enhanced enhanced sentencing goes through, then like, it seems inevitable. So, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Okay, so this is coming oh. back to us on the 13th. Oh, oh, oh that's sorry. right. You got your <laughs> section. Sorry, yes. we're all Perfect. we're all rummy at this point. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, similar to general government funds, we are requesting to increase non-general government fund uh, self-insurance contributions to cover property insurance premiums, workers' compensation, and tort claim settlements. The $3.6 million that you see on the slide, uh, that includes the non-general government contributions of $1.2 million, uh, but it also includes the self-insurance funds uh, increased expenditure authority of $2.4 um, as you know, temporary shelter alternatives were needed for Claire's Place residents. This amendment will appropriate the necessary funds for the city's share of this project. The funding is proposed to come from Affordable and Supportive Housing Fund 171. Uh, that receives a sales tax credit from the state of Washington, um, as well as Safe Streets funding in the Criminal Justice Fund 156. We're also proposing to increase the CIP-1 expenditure budget by $5,357 for the police impound yard additions and alterations project as approved by ordinance. Uh, we're also proposing to increase the CIP-3 expenditure budget for parks projects. Uh, this includes $385,000 for the Phil Johnson Park playground renovation project, uh, as well as $85,000 for the Walter E. Hall community amenities project, uh, both approved uh, by ordinances. Oh, anyone? Yes. <laughs> no, you're okay. The next amendment proposes to increase the CIP4 expenditure budget by $45,000 uh, for relocation advisory services for the Waits Motel. Um, but council did approve a second relocation advisory services contract tonight in the amount of 215,000. Uh, so we will be revising this amendment before the third and final reading next week uh, to appropriate additional CIP4 funds. Um, this will increase the total amendments from $12.1 million to 12.3. Uh, we have a request to appropriate $376,000 for fire and parks replacement vehicles. Uh, there's also a purchase of two radar trailers that will be used by engineering and public services and police, um, as well as a purchase of an encampment response vehicle that will be used by streets. Uh, similar to general government funds, we are requesting to amend the non-general government budget by $9,000 uh, to account for capital outlay expenditures associated with new leases. Uh, this is required uh, by GASB Statement 87. Uh, the amendment provides the budget authority to record the transactions uh, so that we meet those governmental accounting reporting requirements. Council adopted an ordinance that authorized the use of automated traffic safety cameras. This amendment proposes to increase the IT reserve fund expenditure budget by $120,000. Uh, this will be used to implement NCORT, OCORT, and laser fiche systems. Uh, these will be used to process and store court files and documents, uh, but it'll also provide an online payment portal as we do expect uh, ticket volumes to rise uh, through this implementation. Snohomish County uh, is providing the city of Everett with $187,500 of American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA grant funds. Uh, these will be used for increased security in the greater downtown area. Um, increased patrols will be emphasized around emergency and cold weather shelters uh, within downtown and uh, there will be additional security in other high impact areas. The grant supports approximately six months of security services. Uh, if there are any unspent funds at your end, we'll be reappropriating the rest of that um, in the First Amendment of next year. The police department was awarded $39,000 in federal grant funding under the fiscal year 23 JAG grant. Uh, this will be used for the purchase of equipment and technology. Uh, that includes a new polygraph machine and the Star Chase Pursuit Reduction Technology System. Uh, this is a pilot program and it'll be evaluated after one year. Uh, if successful, there will be an ongoing annual subscription fee of $1,500. Um, and uh, as the same one, if there are any unspent funds, we'll also be doing a reappropriation for this grant. 
Uh, the next amendment provides the budget authority to transfer grant funds from Fund 155, uh, General Government Special Projects, uh, to the General Fund to support the community support manager uh, that was described in the General Government proposed amendment. We're proposing to increase annual HUD entitlement grant funds by $612,000 uh, to fund both subrecipient and city projects. Uh, we did have one subrecipient that was approved for a roof replacement uh, estimated at 168000 per resolution that was passed in 2022. Um, but construction expenses for completion required an increase of uh, $162,000 uh, due to an increase in market prices as well as change orders. We also have an additional 450000 that's requested to support uh, city projects. This was uh, approved under resolution number 7879. 225000 of that will go to transit uh, for a seat installation project at bus stops. Uh, and then the other 225000 will go to our CIP3 fund for pedestrian pathway improvements at Walter E. Hall Park. Um, the expenses will uh, be charged to those funds, uh, but there will be a transfer from uh, our CDBG Fund 198 into uh, CIP3 and transit funds. Um, the next amendment uh, proposes to increase expenditure authority in Parks Reserve Fund to pay for utility services at the Deckman Rental House. Um, the rental house will collect <coughs> rental income in the future. Um, however, it's not generating revenue at this time. Uh, lastly, on this slide, we're proposing to increase the Library Reserve Fund's expenditure authority uh, by $10,000 for the purchase of a deli case that will be used at the main library's coffee shop. Uh, council approved two professional service agreements last week. The amendment will increase the real property reserve fund budget by $1.1 million to pay for services related to the proposed stadium project. And lastly, we have a funding request to increase expenditure authority in the 1% for the Arts Fund. Uh, the 1% for the Arts Fund received $880. I, I know it's quite minimal, but we do uh, ensure that we do not have any negative fund balances in our sub funds within our main funds. Uh, but yes, they did receive $880 in 2022 from the main library HVAC replacement project. Um, that project was never started, ultimately abandoned. Uh, so we do have to return those funds uh, from where it came from. Uh, but we do plan on uh, completing that project in 2024, at which point uh, the 1% for the arts uh, would still apply and um, would potentially add a, a transfer back into that fund. All right. Oh, and, and that concludes our presentation. And that's it. Questions, Councilmember Vogley. So sorry, everybody. So close to the end. Um, I would like to hear about the Claire's Place Fund amendment of 233 and change. Uh, yeah, can anybody anybody talk about that and why it's 233? Etc. I remember 116,000, and I'm confused. 150, you heard? 300. Yes, it's so 350,000 that we're requesting. Uh, we haven't used all of those funds. Uh, we do have cost estimates of what we've spent thus far, if you wanted to hear those. I guess essentially, uh, yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> so overall, we've spent 324000 of uh, city funds. Uh, so that would include permanent fencing. Uh, there have been labor attached to this uh, project okay. from facilities, parks, um, public works. Uh, we have to take into account uh, bills to the PUD. Uh, there's electrical with Seahurst um, hygiene, so honey bucket rentals. Uh, shower facility rentals, um, and we did cover the cost of 10 pallets. And okay. The county covered the other 20. Um, so the county's uh, estimates are roughly $250,000. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. That's all. Other questions or comments? I think that brings us to the end.
bring, well, no, I think we have to move on. Uh, so thank you. You're this, the third and final reading will be on uh, next week, actually next Wednesday, you will be back. Okay, and hopefully earlier in the agenda for your sake. <laughs> um, so we do, you do want us to take up the animal control and then maybe we can <coughs> postpone the last two items? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Does that sound agree yes. agreeable? Okay, yeah. we will take up item 24. I will read the correct item, I think, now. <laughs> yes, Council Bill 2310-56, third and final reading, adopt an ordinance relating to animal control, amending chapter 6.04 and 6.08 of the Everett Municipal Code. And I'm, yes. Good evening, Glennis. My thank you for yeah. your patience. All right, thank you for yours. Um, I will try to keep this short and sweet if possible. Um, so, Glennis Fredrickson, Animal Services Manager. Um, I'm here to update Council on some revisions that we'd like to make to Title VI, the Animal Control Code. So, last fall, we brought an ordinance to Council, um, and there was an amendment to um, allow roosters with a facilities permit and there was another amendment to sunset the ordinance after one year. Um, after consideration with our Animal Control Advisory Board um, over several meetings, um, we actually are proposing to repeal the sunset clause. We're also providing, or proposing, whoops, let me move it to the actual background and objections and objectives um, we're also proposing uh, revisions that reflect community values and are more consistent with neighboring communities and updates to make us consistent with state law we believe these changes will up will improve operational efficiency strengthen enforcement tools and improve our residents quality of life <coughs> we are proposing um, well, the Animal Shelter Advisory Board assisted with the process uh, to create um, administrative uh, regulations regarding the approval and denial of facilities permits. Um, and we are uh, re uh, proposing restricting livestock, large livestock that is, to pot -belly pigs, which we would consider to be more household pets, um, and miniature goats. And there are certain size restrictions in, of lot size and also the numbers per household that we are uh, proposing. We are also proposing that the number of rabbits, chickens, and other fowl uh, that are permitted in non-agriculturally zoned areas be based on lot size, which is consistent with many of our neighboring <coughs> communities. Uh, mink and foxes will be prohibited. That was stolen from another neighboring community, and we thought that was a good idea. That might be my dog. Um, we, <laughs> oh, I should, I, I, actually, let me go back to this. So roosters um, <coughs> from the last year's mm -hmm. ordinance, roosters will be, continue to be permitted with a facilities permit um, as long as there are no complaints, uh, legitimate complaints, either about um, the animal welfare or um, uh, nuisance violations, that type of thing. Okay, um, so we have added a new civil violation that uh, <coughs> creates consequences for animal bites. Um, this closes a loophole that was in our dangerous dog section uh, for the seizure of um, potentially dangerous or dangerous dogs um, if they have already had a violation um, of code. So um, that makes it a lot easier as far as enforcement moving forward with some of the, the dogs that we've had some challenges, ongoing challenges with. Uh, we also revised the impound and holding process for potentially dangerous and dangerous dogs. Um, if, if they're seized in violation of um, code, so they've already been declared um, and then something else happens, we can seize them. So we're adding a, a bond um, and a, um, basically a, um, what is it, a, a civil forfeiture process um, so that we don't end up holding these dogs for years um, down the road. And then this past year um, on the state level, there were revisions uh, 
for the civil forfeiture process that's used uh, when animals are seized um, during a cruelty investigation. Um, and these changes include more specific definitions um, pertaining to minimum care um, and also what constitutes animal cruelty. We feel these are great improvements that will help with our enforcement, they will reduce costs and benefit the animals that are involved. And that may also be my dog. Um, any questions? No. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Councilmember Vogley. I just want to say that I think there is data about seeing pictures of cute little cuddly animals as being good for your mental health. So that's very good that you were last. Uh, <laughs> and I have actual things to say, but my computer has gone down. Um, I'm sorry, everybody. I communicated with staff, administration, and residents and feel that these updates to the ordinance are timely and necessary. <coughs> Thank you for the work put in so far, and I look forward to the updates and the forms that are being presented uh, and accessibility of those forms and whatnot as well. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Councilmember Fossey? I've reviewed the changes and I approve. So thank you for all our work. Great. Any other questions or comments? Did I get a motion on this? I can't so moved. Her. <laughs> I didn't. Seconded. Second. Second. Okay, great. Now, any final comments? We didn't have anyone signed up to speak on this, did we, Angie? No, we did not. Okay, thank you. Um, any final questions or comments? Clerk, will you please call the roll? Vice President Tui? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? Yes. Councilmember Vogley? Yes. Councilmember Schwab? Yes. Councilmember Fossey? Yes. Councilmember Zarlingo? Yes. President Stone Cipher? Yes. And we will, uh, do we need to take, uh, uh, Flora, will you help us? Do we need to take action to, to postpone 25 and 26 to the next meeting? Um, if we could just still have our first reading yeah. of those ordinances today, and then we could just delay the briefing to a later meeting, the okay. second or third That's readings great. on them. Thank you for that guidance. Um, I will read these into the record as they are first readings. Item 25 is Council Bill 2311-64, first reading, adopt an ordinance amending EMC 10.02.265, 10.18.025, 10.23.050, and 10.78.110, and creating new sections of EMC 10.16 and EMC 10.78. Third and final reading will be on December 20th. Uh, item 26 is Council Bill 2311-70, first reading, adopt an ordinance relating to public health and safety creating a sentence enhancement ordinance applicable at the prosecutor's option for certain qualifying crimes when necessary preconditions have been met. Uh, and this will also be third and final reading on December 20th. Any questions on the two proposed action? We don't have staff here for them, but any questions? Uh, slightly unrelated. Thank you for the treats, Angie. <laughs> Okay, uh, no, with no questions, and uh, we will get those briefings at our next meeting, and with no further business or executive session, we are now adjourned.